Hi, we're nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary, the podcast where Spencer reads the, dic- the dictionary and uh, tells you some stuff also in his head. Um, so uh, there there will be no sound effect in this episode. I'm very sorry to tell you that. Um, I mean, that's a good thing, though, because this whole sound effect thing is going off the rails. Uh, I, I, you know, may- maybe we'll, we'll, we'll adjust it. We'll figure it out. But no sound effect in this episode. Why? Because we have one word. We have the first form of one word. We're not even going to get to the other forms of it in this episode. Just because of the way the things go. Uh, But we do have some uh, pictures to talk about this one word. And that was not a proper sentence. But we'll get there. Okay. It's the word cross. C-R-O-S-S. People have feelings about crosses, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna take it. Um, well, you know, there's crosses, and then there's other. There's there's many many definitions for the word cross. Maybe you didn't know that, but uh, yeah, we're we're gonna talk about all of them. Okay, yeah, first form of cross noun from before the twelfth century. One a, a structure consisting of an upright with a transverse beam used especially by the ancient Romans for execution. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that most of us know that, but, you know, that was it very specifically. We, we'll, we'll say it again. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece that goes vertical, and there's another piece that goes horizontal, and ancient Romans and maybe others used it to kill people. 1B. This one is often capitalized... It is the cross on which Jesus was crucified. Now, is that the very, the literal one, the the very same one that he was crucified on, or just, you know, the idea of the one that he was crucified on? I don't know. Yeah, cruci- crucifixion is the name of the thing uh, when, when somebody is killed on a cross. Uh, and I believe that the first part of that word, Cruce, crucify, cruce, whatever that that first prefix would be, um, means cross. I think. I, I, w- I would be shocked if it doesn't. Okay, here we go. Number 2A, the synonym is crucification. Oh, no, it's crucifixion. I just read it so fast. Crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I-F-I-X-I-O-N. I F in the middle there, we've got I-F-I-X-I. To be an affliction that tries one's virtue, steadfastness, or patience. What what would this affliction be? Number three. A cruciform sign made to invoke the blessing of Christ, especially by touching the forehead, breast, and shoulders. So yeah, when you well, <laughs> there's there's things that people say, but basically yes, you touch uh, your forehead, your chest, and then both of your shoulders, and then you are essentially making uh, a cross symbol on your body, the top part of your body. Uh, and then some people will say, what do they say? Uh, something something wallet and watch glasses something wallet and watch. I don't remember what it is, but yeah, it's just it's like a mnemonic to remember like of the different places that you're pointing to. I think it's a little bit dated these days, though. 4A, a device composed of an upright bar transversed by a horizontal one, specifically one used as a Christian symbol. And that's obviously very similar to 1A. Uh, why, Why they're separated, I'm not sure. This one must be slightly different. Not sure how. It's the same shape and everything. Uh, okay, before we move on to the rest of the definitions, now is probably a good time to talk about the picture because um, it says cross for A, and then it lists the 20 different crosses. Yeah, there's 20 here. There could be more in the world, but we've got 20 here. Um, And then, yeah, I will briefly describe all 20 of them and give you their name. 
I had no idea. Okay, so number one, it's called Latin. It's the Latin cross. And this is just the standard cross with the vertical piece. And then the horizontal piece is much shorter than the vertical piece. Maybe by half. Maybe it's half as short. Uh, it looks like a lowercase t. And this is the cross that everybody thinks of. Usually. And then and then we get fancy. Number two is Calvar Calvary. Calvary. So it's the same cross as in number one, but below it, it looks like it's sitting on a pedestal, a three-tiered pedestal. Uh, you know, there's a, a wide horizontal piece, and then there's another horizontal piece sitting on top of that first one that's a little bit shorter, and then there's another one that's a little bit shorter, and then the cross sits on top of that. That's the Calvary cross. Number three is the patriarchal or the cross of Lorraine. So this cross is very, very similar to the first one again. A vertical piece, a horizontal piece that's shorter. But the horizontal piece looks like um, instead of being near the top, it's pretty close to the center. And then above that is yet another horizontal piece that's even shorter still. So it's, got, it's like a double cross kind of. Number four, it's called Papal, P-A-P-A-L. And then this one, they took number three and then stepped it up another notch. So yeah, a vertical piece, a shorter horizontal piece in the center, another horizontal piece that's shorter above that, and then there's a third horizontal piece, even shorter still, above that second one. This, the picture of this one, though, is about twice as big as the number three cross. Did they do that because they needed to make sure that they had room for the third horizontal piece or something? I don't know. Maybe it's always bigger, but uh, yeah, it's got three horizontal beams, crosses on top of a vertical one. Number five is called Cross of Lorraine. That's the same name as number three. Number three was Patriarchal or Cross of Lorraine. Number five is Cross of Lorraine. Now this one, this one, it you, t you take a regular cross, and then you take another cross, and then you take that same cross, and you flip it upside down, and then you combine the two of those together. That's this cross. You got a vertical piece. You got the horizontal piece near the top, just like number one, but then you have another horizontal piece near the bottom, and it might even be a little bit longer than the first horizontal piece. But either way, it's, there's a cross near the top and a cross near the bottom, and uh, it's, it's the cross of Lorraine. Number six, this one's called Greek, and this cross, uh, the horizontal piece and the vertical piece look to be the same length, and uh, they, they cross each other right in the center. So it looks like a plus sign. That's what it is. It's a plus sign. But it's a Greek cross. Number seven is Celtic. So we take the cross from number one, the standard cross that we think of, and we have added a circle behind it. Uh, a circle that is centered on the part where the two pieces meet and then the circle goes almost to the end of the the horizontal piece and the top there's a little bit extra cross past the circle and that's that's the celtic cross number eight is maltese now this one this is this looks fun um okay how do we describe this one so it's the, it's the general shape of number six, which is Greek, which is the plus sign. But instead of the beams being rectangular at the ends, they, they, they each part flares out from the center. So it's kind of like four arrows, four arrow heads pointing to the center, and then they merge there. But at the end, the outside of each of those arrowheads, the widest parts... Um, they're sort of notched in at an angle. Of course, I'll probably post a picture of this whole thing on Instagram or something. But uh, but yeah, they're notched in at an angle 
they're like it's it's sort of like double arrows that first part is pointing towards the center and then the actual piece is an arrowhead pointing into the center it's very hard to describe that one number nine is saint andrews this one you take number six the plus sign it's equal horizontally and vertically but then you you rotate it you rotate it 45 degrees so it's kind of sitting on its side a little bit and uh, this one looks like the multiplication symbol it looks like an x that is what it is it's an x that's the best way to describe it number 10 is tau t-a-u and i have to assume that it looks close to the greek letter tau probably the capital version of it and it kind of looks like a big t a big capital t um so it's the vertical piece is wide on the bottom and it goes in it gets skinnier as it goes up and then the horizontal piece sits on top so it's not uh it's not crossing down a little bit it's sitting on top and the the ends of the horizontal piece the top piece uh they sort of flare out 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 to the outsides and then they kind of come to a point yeah that's the that's the tau cross number 11 it is called pomme maybe that's how you say it p o m m e e with an accent on the first e pomme pomme okay so this cross uh the beams the beams are skinnier than most of the other crosses that we've been talking about they're so they're, so they're skinny skinny crosses skinny beams and each one has basically a circle at the end of it, a round, bulbous piece. And the crosses, the vertical and the horizontal pieces, are crossing right in the center. They look to be about the same length, kind of like number six, the plus symbol. But these are skinny beams with circles on the ends. Twelve is called botane, botany. One of those, probably. Uh, so this one is, uh, you take number 11 with the skinny crosses and the balls, and but you add each of the ends, instead of just one ball at the end, they have three balls on the end. It sort of looks like a club. If you're playing with the playing cards, you got diamonds and hearts and spades and then clubs. Clubs have those sort of three rounded things at the end. That is what is at the end of every single one of the four pieces the ends of the beams on number 12. 13, this one is called Fleury. I think that's an L, F-L-E-U-R-Y, Fleury. And uh, it's got some flourishes on it. It's very similar to number 12, what we just said with the clubs at the end. But instead of the clubs being rounded, they're kind of pointed. The one in the center is pointed off in the direction that it's facing, up, down, left, right, but then the other two, uh, the, the other two balls on the side, they they curve down towards the center of the cross into a point. So uh, yeah, it look it kind of looks like a uh, a banana with the banana peel. Two pieces of the banana peel. Fourteen, it is called Avalon, maybe Avalan. Uh, this one's going to be very hard to describe. It's got the general shape of number six, the plus sign, equal equal beams, vertical and horizontal. But the, the beams are kind of wavy, and then they got three points at the ends of each of the beams. Essentially, that's what that is. Fifteen is called Moline, or that is pronounced some other way. All right, how do we describe this one? It's got the vertical beam. It's got the horizontal beam. This horizontal beam is uh, it's going right through the center, but it is not as long as the vertical beam. So that's the first part. Vertical beam, horizontal shorter beam right in the center, and then at the end of every single point, all four points, I'll just call them points. I don't know if that's accurate. Uh, it's like... It's like the beam gets split and then curved out and down. Uh, how, how else do you describe that? Kind of looks like the, uh, 
a whale tail. That's kind of what that looks like. You know, when the uh, the whale brings their tail up above the surface of the water, that's sort of the shape that it is, and that's at the end of every single piece. 16, it's called forme or for me. Again, it's the general shape of number six, the plus sign, but instead of the beams being equal, like rectangular all around, they flare out very aggressively from the center, and that that's, happens on all four sides. 17 is forche, or forchi. Again, same general shape, vertical and horizontal, equal size, right in the center, but... At the ends, um, it's, a, it's a Y shape, basically. It gets split, and then the ends go off in 45-degree angles, so it looks like a Y, like a capital Y. Why? I don't know. 18, crosslet. Oh, it's like a, it's like a little cross, a crosslet. <laughs> okay, so this one, uh, again, same, same shape, vertical, horizontal, equal size, right in the center, but... In addition, each one of the pieces, top, left, uh, top, top, bottom, left, right, each one of those is again crossed um, by a shorter piece that goes perpendicular to each one of the respective pieces. Um, so it, what it basically looks like is the very number one cross, but all four, you know, rotated 90 degrees, rotated again, rotated again. There's four of them, and the bottom parts of each of them are melded together right in the center there. That's what that looks like. 19 is called quadrate. And, uh, okay, so let's again take the general number six cross, the plus sign cross, and we're going to put a square in the center right on top of it all. The square... Um, it's about half of the distance or maybe a third of the distance of the, each vertical and horizontal piece. And it just covers the whole center. It's just a square there. I don't know. That's, that's the easiest way to describe that one. It's like a small square on top of number six. And number 20, it's called potent. Potent. Um, okay, this one looks like four capital T's with their bottoms merged together. And uh, yeah, that's the easiest way to say that one. <sighs> okay, now we have to then finish the rest of the definitions. So that was 4A. Now we're going to go to 4B. It is capitalized, and it is the Christian religion. Hmm, I don't know if I realize that. The, Christ the Christian religion is also just called cross. 5 a structure as a monument shaped like or surmounted by a cross. Six, a figure or mark formed by two intersecting lines crossing at their midpoints, specifically such a mark used as a signature. In the movie Dumbo, I think the mom, she just signs her name as an X. Some people, I don't know, if people didn't know how to write, I guess they would just sign their name as an X. That's a cross. Number seven, a cruciform badge, emblem, or decoration. Eight, the intersection of two ways or lines. Synonym is crossing. Nine, synonyms are annoyance and thwarting, as in a cross in love. Now I want to see a, a romantic comedy of two of those 20 crosses falling in love. 10A, an act of crossing dissimilar individuals. 10B, a crossbred individual or kind. That, uh, that thing was crossed. A liger is, crossed, is a cross between a lion and a tiger. A liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. 10C. One that combines characteristics of two different types or individuals. 11A. A fraudulent or dishonest 
contest. Hmm. 10B, dishonest or illegal practices. And this is used especially in the phrase, on the cross. If I heard that, I would assume that it meant the Christ cross, but I don't know if it is. Dishonest or legal? Interesting. 12. A movement from one part of a theater stage. <laughs> a movement from one part of a theater stage to another. Uh, if you, you, because you're crossing, you're crossing across it. You go from one, the left side, maybe to the right side. And you're crossing the stage. 13A. A punch thrown over the opponent's lead in boxing. So, does that mean that they, if one person is punching with their arm and then the other person punches across that arm and hits them, that's a, is that a cross? Or, oh, maybe, no, 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 no. I think it's maybe uh, you cross, when you hit from maybe your right hand and you hit their left, their, their right side, so you're crossing your body to hit them. Is that what it is? I don't know, boxing. I should do it. It's a good exercise. 13B, an attacking pass in soccer played across the field from one side to the other or to the middle. And 14, a security transaction in which a broker acts for both buyer and seller as in the placing of a large lot of common stock. And that is called also cross-trade. Um, let's look at the etymology. I'm going to start at the most recent Middle English, from Old English, from Old Norse, or Old Irish, uh, from Latin. And then the uh, Old Norse is spelled cross with a K, and the Old Irish is cross with, still with a C, but just one S. And then the Latin is crux, C-R-U-X, or the prefix, well, would you say crook or cruce, probably, C-R-U-C. That's crucifixion, cruce, cross, C. That's what I was talking about before. You didn't believe me. So it really just always stayed the word cross, just changed languages. Latin, Old Irish, Old Norse, uh, Old English, Middle English, and then today English. This was a fun and weird episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's uh, I guess I have to. The cross is the word of the episode. Did you want me to say it? I said it. Uh, do I have to sing a song about a cross? This is my song about the cross. There's a lot of feelings that people have about crosses. I don't really care one way or the other. There's lots of different kinds of crosses. Latin, Calvary, Patriarchal, or Cross of Lorraine. We're not going to read them all. Hey, thank you very much for listening to this. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Um, let's see. So yesterday we started the cross section of this book. And we are going to have, including yesterday's episode, one, two, three, four, five, six, six plus episodes that all start with the word cross in in some way, in some way. Hey, let's talk about them. The first one is uh, the second form of cross. This is a verb from the 14th century. And I'm going to turn the headphones down. So, uh, let's see. It's a verb, and we are starting with transitive. 1A, to lie or be situated across. 1B, the synonym is intersect. That's what happens when a cross is made. There are two things intersecting, maybe more than two things. 2, to make the sign of the cross upon or over. Uh, vampires, they don't like that. Three, to cancel by marking a cross, to cancel by marking a cross on or drawing a line through. Uh, also, strike out. 
It's not the strikeout in baseball. It's the striking out of letters or a thing. As in, cross names off a list. Why might you be crossing names off a list? Oh, we've seen so many shots like that in movies and TV shows. The first one I can think of is it uh, uh, Steve Buscemi in uh, one of the Adam Sandler movies. Maybe it was Billy Madison. He, uh, I think he crossed off some names on a list. Number four, to place or fold crosswise one over the other, as in cross the arms. How do you cross your arms? Is it left hand over right hand, right hand over left hand? Uh, I don't know how I do it. I can't really do it with the microphone in my hand. Um, and then you try to go the way that you're not used to going, and it's hard to do. You gotta, you gotta put a lot of thought into it. Arms cross. I, I do it sometimes, but it's a not it's not great um, for um, for body language. It doesn't look so good when you cross your arms to other people. You know, it makes makes you look a little more standoffish. Um, even though maybe it's comfortable, it's just an unconscious thing. Number five, A1. To run counter to, and the synonym is oppose. Would that be like uh, uh, politicians running against each other? They're crossing each other? 5A2. To deny the validity of. To deny the validity of. And the synonym is contradict. 5B. To confront in a troublesome manner. And the synonym is obstruct. 5C1. To spoil completely. And the synonym is disrupt. And this is used with the word up, as in his failure to appear crossed up the whole program. Oh boy, that program got all disrupted and crossed up. I don't think I've heard this before. Uh, His failure to appear crossed up the whole program. I don't think I would use crossed in that situation myself. Okay, now we have 5C2, to turn against, and the synonym is betray, as in, crossed me up on the deal. Crossed me up on the deal. I would think of that more in terms of, uh, let's see, the example I would give maybe is like, um, I've been crossed, he crossed me, not crossed me up on the deal. Okay, number 6A. To extend across or over, and the synonym is traverse, as in a highway crossing the entire state. There are highways that cross many, many states from the East Coast to the West Coast all the way. Um, 6B synonyms are reach and attain, as in only to cross the finish line. Oh, what happened to the rest of them? Did they fail? 6C. To go from one side of to the other. To go from one side of to the other. As in, cross a street. You got to make sure that you're looking both ways, though. In fact, you may want to look left, and then you may want to look right, and then you should probably look left again, just to make sure that something didn't happen while you were looking away towards the right. When you go to another country... You have to check to see if they drive on the side of the street that is opposite from what you're used to. So if you live in America, you're used to cars driving on the right side, you should look left first. But if you go to London or other countries where they drive on the left side of the road, you need to make sure you need to look right first. Either way, just look at least both directions once before you walk out. Also is in, crosses racial barriers. What does that? 7A, to draw a line across. 7B, to mark or figure with lines. And the synonym is streak. To mark or figure with lines. What would that be? Number eight, to cause to interbreed with one of a different kind. The synonym is hybridize. And the example of the thing that this is all happening to is an animal or a plant. 
to cause an animal or plant to interbreed with one of a different kind. If you cross, we just I just mentioned this example um, yesterday, the day before, I don't remember, uh, a liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Where did we have that? I don't know, somewhere. Um, and yes, hybridize is the act of making a hybrid. Nine, to meet and pass on the way, as in our letters must have crossed each other. That that definitely happens. Uh, although, I mean, it's not like people are sending a whole lot of letters these days, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, maybe like an insurance company will sell, t- send you a bill, but, but right after they sent it, you paid it online, but then you still get the bill and you're like, wait a minute, did I pay this? I think I paid this. I have to call them. And then they say, oh, it must have crossed in the the ethers 10 to occur to as in it never crossed my mind it never occurred to my brain to do that thing that i that uh, that definitely happens to me a lot didn't cross my mind maybe it seems logical to you not to me 11 to carry or take across something as in crossed the children at the intersection so you gotta you gotta help the kids across maybe they haven't learned uh, looking both ways yet or they just don't remember how to do it because they're too young so help them cross the intersection now we have intransitive 1a to move pass or extend across something as in crossed through france it's probably a fun trip also is in, crossed over to the other side of the river. What's going on over there? 1B, to move or pass from one character, condition, or allegiance to another. And this is used with the word over, as in, crossing over to vote for another party's candidate. Wait a minute, are you allowed to do that? How, how do you do that? Number two. To lie or be athwart each other. To lie or be athwart each other. Uh, so is that literally telling lies to people or something? Three, to meet in passing, especially from opposite directions. You, you literally, you're crossing each other's paths, paths, and then maybe you say, Hi, hello, I'm coming from this direction, you're coming from that direction. Number four, synonyms are interbreed and hybridize. Crosser is a noun. Cross paths is a phrase, uh, which means to meet especially by chance, as in crossed paths with an old friend on a business trip. Cross swords, that is another phrase, to engage in a dispute. You are metaphorically crossing your swords because you are going to fight. Maybe you are. Maybe you will cross pens. Maybe you will fight with words. Yeah, cross swords. Uh, that is it for the second form of cross. Boo boo boo. Third form of cross. Adjective from the 14th century. One a line across or athwart. This is a fun word, athwart. Do, do we do we need to go back and remind ourselves of what it means? Because uh, I sure don't remember. Um, let's see. I'm actually getting pretty close. So, athwart. Athwart. We got a couple of those. Uh, it's just across, in opposition to. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Or an oblique angle. 1B, moving across. As in, cross traffic. But you gotta be very careful. I crossed traffic in India when I was there on a work trip, and that is dangerous, and you gotta be careful uh, and quick. Gotta be quick. 2A, running counter. Synonym is opposite. uh, 2B, mutually opposed. As in, cross purposes. The purposes... Of the people, my purpose is mutually opposed to your purpose. So we have our purposes are crossing. Three, 
involving mutual interchange, and the synonym is reciprocal. 4. Marked by typical transitory bad temper. 5. Extending over or treating several groups, conditions, or classes. Extending over or treating several groups, conditions, or classes, as in a cross sample from 25 colleges. It's just, it's a, it's a, hmm, how do you describe that? A cross sample is a very good uh, sampling of those 25 colleges or whatever it is, um, you know, to make sure that you have, th- you're, you're covering all of the, um, all of the, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? You're covering all of the different uh, groups equally. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sometimes you got bad cross samples. Number six, the synonyms are crossbred and hybrid. Crossly is an adverb. Crossness is a noun. And that is all for that. Now we have the fourth form of cross. It is a preposition from 1551, and the synonym is just a cross. And I forgot to do a sound effect there. Boo, 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 boo. There I did it. Now I got to do it again because we have another word. Boo, 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 boo. Crossability. One word, noun from 1916. The ability of different species or varieties to cross with each other. Not all species can uh, mate together. Uh, well, in fact, I guess you would probably say all species can't, right? The ability of different species, I guess some can. Um, you know, so like, I think all dogs can crossbreed with each other, so they are they have crossability. But you know, you can't cross a cat and a dog. As much as we want to, I don't know, maybe, maybe science in some way can splice genes together, but... Uh, Typically, cats and dogs, they don't have crossability. Boop, 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 boo. Next is crossable. You know, same, we're in the same world here. Adjective from 1865, capable of being crossed. Um, crossable, I mean, you know, I think we're talking about, you know, m- making uh, animals mate with each other. But if you, you can be, somebody can cross you. Um, and make you mad, so I guess you'd be crossable. That's not what we're talking about, though, I don't think. Boo, 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 boo! Next is cross action. Two words, noun from circa 1859. A legal action in which the defendant in an existing action files a suit against the plaintiff on the same subject matter. And the synonym is countersuit. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Somebody sues somebody, and then the other, so then the second person goes ahead and sues the first person. That's also called cross action. Boo boop boo boo. Next is cross banding. One word, noun from 1904. A veneer border, as on furniture, with its grain at right angles to the grain of the adjacent wood. And cross-banded is an adjective. So let's say the grain of the wood is going left to right, but then the wood next to it, the grain is going, uh, let's say, up to down. You know, it's been rotated 90 degrees, and then, you know, you you do that over and over again, and you got kind of a cool pattern, maybe. Uh, Maybe we should find some... uh, Uh, examples of this cross banding with wood or on furniture, maybe in a floor. Uh, We'll post that on the social media. At DictionaryPod on Instagram and Twitter if you're curious. Boop, 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 boop. Next is crossbar. Crossbar. One word, noun from 1562. A transverse bar or stripe. It's just a bar or a stripe. Boo, 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 boo. Next is cross beam. One word, noun from 1594. A transverse beam. It's, it's, you know, how 
cross bar is a transverse bar, a cross beam is a transverse beam. Uh, these are probably used in architecture, um, probably for structural reasons, but maybe also sometimes for uh, for the prettiness value. Not usually. I think it's more for structure, but they do look nice. Yeah, you look in the ceiling, there might be some cross beams. Boop, 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 boop. Next is cross bearer, noun from 1568. And we just have the number one definition for the word crucifer. Crucifer. So, huh, I, yeah, I never heard of that, uh, that word, crucifer. Um, so, yeah, the one who is carrying the cross is a crucifer because uh, that, you know, cruce means cross. Boop, boop, boop. Next is cross bill, one word. Noun from circa 1672. Any of a genus of finches with curved mandibles that cross each other. What is, what is, how do they cross each other? Um, the genus name is Loxia. That's with an X. And that is of the family Fringillidae. Fringillidae. Um, but why? How? What's going on with these mandibles? They're curved and they cross? We got to find a picture of a cross bill because literally their bill crosses. Boo, 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 boo. Next is crossbones. One word, noun from 1686. Two leg or arm bones placed or depicted crosswise. And then it says compare to skull and crossbones. I hope that we all know what this is. This is the very stereotypical image on a flag uh, for the pirates. It would be a, a skull and then two bones that are crossing below to make like an X. Sometimes it's just the bones. Sometimes, or sorry, I should say sometimes it's just the, the long bones and not the skull. Sometimes the skull is in there too. It's just crossbones. You get two bones and you cross them. That's all there is to it. It's easy. Boo, 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 boo. Next is crossbow. One word, noun from the 15th century. A weapon for shooting quarrels and stones that consists chiefly of a short bow mounted crosswise near the end of a stock. How do you shoot a quarrel? What is a quarrel? I only know quarrels in terms of arguments but it must be something else. Also, it didn't say anything about arrows. Is a quarrel an arrow? Uh, what? Consists chiefly of a short bow mounted crosswise near the... Yeah, it's just normally, you know, bow and arrow, you hold it vertically in your arms, but a crossbow, you're holding it like a... I guess it's like a gun. You could say that. And then the bow is um, horizontal across the thing. Next is crossbred, B-R-E-D, adjective from 1856. No, it is not the bread that we eat. What would that be, crossbred? Oh, hot cross buns. Maybe that's crossbred. Um, maybe it's just, can you, can you, can you cross two different kinds of bread and cook it together? And what sort of shape or design would it make? You wouldn't roll it, probably. How can you make cross bread? How can you cross two types of bread? What is it? Rye bread and wheat bread, rye bread, and soda bread? Can you even cook those together? Well, do they need the same temperature, the same time? That's probably a very complicated process to do. Anyway, cross bread... Produced by crossbreeding, and the synonym is hybrid. Crossbred is also a noun. Next, boop, 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 boop. it is crossbreed, one word. This is our last word, and we have two forms. So the first form, uh, let's see, you can say, you can emphasize either syllable, crossbreed or crossbreed. Verb, 
from 1675, starting with transitive. The synonyms are hybridize and cross, especially to cross within the same species. And the examples of the things that you are crossing are two varieties or breeds. So two breeds of dogs as an example, or two varieties of plant. You can, you can do that. You can do that too. Somehow people are smart enough to have figured out how to do that. Um, then we have intransitive, to engage in or undergo hybridization. Boop, 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 boop. Last word, second form of crossbreed, noun from 1774, and the synonym is just hybrid. So anything that is a hybrid of two or more other things is a crossbreed thing. So the words in this episode were cross, 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 crossability, crossable, cross action, cross banding, cross bar, cross beam, cross bearer, cross bill, cross bones, cross bow, cross bred, cross breed, cross breed. I will pick crossbones as the word of the episode. Crossbones, crossbones. I think I may just start singing the words in a tune because when I add other words, it gets very complicated. Crossbones. That is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening to this. And uh, hey, yeah, until next time. You could just turn on the next episode. If unless you're hearing this on the day that it airs, go start the next episode. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. Yeah, 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 yeah. The dictionary. Um It's it's a very odd thing. To have it be your almost nightly ritual or almost daily ritual of sitting on your bed and pulling out the old dictionary and audio recorder and then talking into a mic for a little bit about this section of words. It's, it's, uh, it's very strange. For the last three years, it's been, this has been a thing. It's, you know, when you think about it, it's just very odd. Um, gotta go to work now. <laughs> record the dictionary it's just very we, my wife and i joke about that sometimes uh okay so just today i was thinking about how much is left of the letter c when is it going to end it's it's coming up it's pretty soon oh wait let me do the math so i figured out there's got to be at least 40 more episodes of the letter c at least it was like that it seems like there should be more, right? So there's at least 40. So I just did the count. It's about 56. This is like the 56th to the end, 56th to the last episode of the letter C. What a momentous occasion. We're getting so close to it. So yeah, it's like two months. Two months, we'll be there. Uh, what's going to happen? I don't know. We shall find out together. Well, you'll find out later than me. All right, so... After all that blibber blabber, I got to give you more blibber blabber because you're here to listen to it. Uh, You can email me at dictionarypod at gmail.com. If you want to throw a few bucks my way, you can do that over at patreon.com because for some reason this deserves money. Put give me the money so I can do this, I guess. Uh, And uh, social media, Instagram and Twitter is at dictionarypod trying to slow down uh there is a google voice number which you could call and say hello and say some things to me and then uh, maybe i will have you say those things to the rest of the people who listen if i want to put it in an episode because i would more than likely do that um what is this? i think that's i think that's all most of it okay the end of page 298 um, oh, on the whole track of how many 
episodes for letter C. Just today, I scheduled the 500th episode of the letter C. So that's, they say that's a momentous occasion too. Oh, the first word is cross-check. Two words with a hyphen. First form. It is a transitive verb from circa 1930. And I can just see myself in the future with probably a magnifying glass <laughs> trying to read this thing. Uh, okay, number one for cross-check. To obstruct in ice hockey or lacrosse by thrusting one's, thrusting one's stick held in both hands across an opponent's face or body. This is an illegal thing to do, isn't it? You're, you can't do that. Cross-check them. Um, so yeah, you're putting your hands or uh, the stick crossways across their body. Their body goes up and down. The thing, your, the stick, your hands, your arms go left, right. You just smack them real hard in the face or body. Number two, to check as data or reports from various angles or sources to determine validity or accuracy. Oh, you always got to cross-check your data, make sure it's accurate, maybe even three or four times if you can. I just remembered that I did not check my audio, and I think it is fine. Maybe a little on the high side, but usually it is. Um, okay, the sound effect will be... Bum, bum. The second form of cross-check is a noun from 1937. It still has that hyphen. This is an act or instance of cross-checking. Uh, it's either the in ice hockey or lacrosse move or checking the data. Yeah. What is the sound? Da -da. Next is cross claim. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1952. A claim against a party on the same side of a legal action. Wait, what? The claim against a party on the same side? Does that mean you're 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 bringing a claim to the person who you're who was on your side, who you're with? Is that that can't be right? It's got to be going across from defendant to the other one prosecutor uh okay but next is cross country two words with a hyphen first form cross country adjective from 1767 one extending or moving across a country as in a cross concert tour no a cross country concert tour so many huh. a cross country concert tour this band is going to get in the bus and drive all around the country going to different cities and playing the music for the people make them happy number two proceeding over countryside and not by roads uh, and the, the examples of this countryside could be across fields or through woods. How pleasant. Across fields or through woods. That's much more pleasant than going by roads. Three, of or relating to racing or skiing over the cross countryside. No, just the countryside. It's not the cross countryside. Over the countryside instead of over a track or run. Never got into that. It just seemed too long and boring for me. Cross country, two words with a hyphen, is an adverb. Ba -doom, ba -doom. Second form of cross country, two words with hyphen, noun from 1918. Cross country racing or skiing. Yeah, that's that didn't seem fun to me. It's probably a very good workout. Ba -doom, ba -doom. Next is cross court, one word, adverb or adjective from 1915, to or toward the opposite side of a court, as in tennis or basketball. Uh, definitely, I can think of that in tennis. When you serve, don't you have to serve cross court? So you're going to the other side of the net and then across to the other side of the court. If you're on the right side, maybe they're on the left side. Are there rules to... 
which side of the court your side you have to serve from is it a right-handed left-handed thing do we do they switch i don't follow tennis enough but i just watched king richard and i think i noticed they go to the like the one corner but i don't know if they ever i don't know if i noticed if they ever serve from the other corner because then cross court would change boom 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 next is cross cultural two words with a hyphen Adjective from circa 1942. Did you did you hear that sound? That was just some bubbles in my throat. I had no idea that was going to happen. It's very quiet. Not sure if you'll be able to pick it up. I hope you do. Okay, cross-cultural. Dealing with or offering comparison between two or more different cultures or cultural areas. Cross-culturally is an adverb. So what dealing with or offering comparison... Uh, so you're comparing cultures and you're you're crossing them, seeing what's the same and what's different. Uh, yeah. Boop a doo, boop a doo. Next is cross current. One word you can emphasize. Uh, let's see, cross current, or what's the difference there? I can't tell. <laughs> the R sound is either in the second syllable or the third syllable. That's the difference. How do I say that it, with my voice? Cross current or cross current. Oh, maybe it is a little different. Cross current. That one's weird. Okay, this is a noun from 1598. One, a current running counter to the general forward direction. We are generally uh, a current running counter to the general forward. So is it going, is it going uh, perpendicular or is it going the opposite direction? 180 degrees around which which is it could be e- could it be either it's uh, not saying exa- it's not being as specific number two a conflicting tendency and this is usually used in plural as in political cross currents boo boo next is the first form of cross cut or cross cut Transitive verb from 1590. One, to cut, go, or move across or through. Two, to cut with a cross-cut saw. Three, to subject, as movie scenes, to cross-cutting. Uh, that's, I think we're, sorry for the yawns. Hope you're all yawning now. That would be wonderful. Um, that is when you're cross, you cut, you edit the film, so you're you're on one scene, you're following this one thing happening, and then you cut to another scene, see what's going on over there, and then you crop, cut back to the first scene, see what has changed. Is there is there a juxtaposition between what we just saw from scene two, or and then to scene one? I wish that you could see me. We'll have to do video someday so you can see me because I'm doing gestures with my hand. Um, yeah, so that's cross-cutting. You go back and forth between two scenes, maybe more, and maybe you, you do it for some reason. There's got to be a, a meaning behind the reason to edit that way, probably. Boo, boop. Okay, I think we're here with the second form of cross-cut adjective from 1645. One, made or used for cutting transversely, as in a saw with cross-cut teeth. Got to cut across the transverse. Two, cut across or transversely, as in a cross-cut incision. Is that uh, if so? If the surgeon has made a cut, and then when they make a cut going ninety degrees, going perpendicular, would that be a transverse, a transverse across cut incision? I am. I ask these questions because. They give you pretty good information, but, you know, you could get a, I don't know what, I guess transversely, then I have to go to the T's in the book. It's just, it's this never ending thing of hopping from one part to the next part. Can you go through the whole book by just hopping words? What takes you to the next thing? What takes you to the next thing? No, I don't think so. I think you'd miss a lot. Do, do, do. Third form of cross cut, noun from 1789. One, something that cuts across or through, specifically a mine 
working, driven horizontally, a mine work. Wait, how does this sentence go? A mine working, driven horizontally and at right angles to an at it, drift, or level. A mine working, driven horizontally. My brain is missing something very clearly. Um, and at right angles. Anyway, all that stuff. Number two, the synonym is cross-section. Cross-cut, cross-section. Three, synonym is cross-cut saw. Remember, this is the noun form. Number four, an instance of cross-cutting, as in a movie. Next is cross-cut saw, two words, noun from 1645, a saw designed chiefly to cut across the grain of wood. And then compare to rip saw, which I assume would be the antonym which would go with the grain of wood, not against the grain of wood. So would against the grain of wood, I believe that yes, that would be going perpendicular to the direction. If the if the if the grain of the wood is more stretchy long ways left to right, then you would be cutting it up to down or the other direction. Uh, cross cut and so um, it must the grain must be hard to cut across, so it's got its very specific teeth. Uh, it's just probably a stronger saw, I guess. Yeah. There are, how many saws are there? Maybe when we get to uh, S and saw, we'll, we'll learn about how many kinds of saws are there. Next is cross-cutting. One word, noun from 1930. Here's that editing thing. A technique, especially in filmmaking of interweaving bits of two or more separate scenes. You're taking the bits from the scenes and you interweave them. Boo boop. Uh, the next is cross-dressing. Two words with a hyphen. This is uh, definitely a problematic word these days. Probably was before, but especially now. This is not a, not a term we use anymore. Noun from 1911. The wearing of clothes designed for the opposite sex. And it's not that the act is not happening anymore. It just typically the... I feel like this phrase is just not one that people prefer to use. No, obviously there are going to be people who do prefer to use it. But I think largely this is not necessarily the best term these days. Um, so yes, if I didn't finish the wearing of clothes designed for the opposite sex, and then cross dress is an intransitive verb. Cross dresser is a noun. I don't know why I have this like bluesy jazzy thing that's that comes out more often than not. Okay. Next is cross. So it is just the standard word cross with an E. Noun from 1867, a stick with a small net at one end that is used in lacrosse. That's the name of the stick? Is the cross? Ho oh, ho, this is blowing my mind. And then, oh my god, and then the name lacrosse, L A, probably stands for the. And so it's, if you just replace it with, say, stick, because that's kind of what it is. The name of the game is The Stick. That is what lacrosse is called. Basketball, you put a ball in a basket. We're not very creative when we come up with sports names, are we? Baseball. <laughs> you play with the ball and you run around bases. Football. You kick it with your foot rarely. Except if it's soccer, then that's actually football. In that case, you kick it with your foot only. Soccer, who knows what that name is. Golf, who knows what that name is. But calling this game us a the stick actually makes sense. But it's very silly. Okay. Cross. Where did it go? Um, the, there's no... Oh, the uh, it's French. And it literally means crozier. Uh, we had that one. Here it is. Uh, a staff 
um, or a plant, yeah, a staff, basically. So, yeah, back in the day, whenever this was, 1867, uh, they just took a, a stick, a branch, a, a walking stick, you know, a good sturdy stick that was fairly straight, and then maybe they probably put figured out how to just put a net on it. How, how are we going to throw a ball back and forth? We need a net on it. So this it's the stick. Yeah. Boo, boo. Next is cross-examination, two words with a hyphen. Noun from circa 1707. The examination of a witness who has already testified in order to check or to check or discredit the witness's testimony, knowledge, or credibility. And then compare to the antonym, direct examination. So uh, this person sitting at the stand, the judge is there, lawyer comes up, they do a direct examination, talking to them. If it's their witness, then they're probably going to help their case. Then the other side gets to come in and they do their cross-examination, trying to ask questions to make them sound not plausible, inaccurate. Uh, Maybe they got more information that they're hiding. Who knows? That's a cross-examination. Counsel, would you like to cross-examine the the witness? No, I would like... Oh, my God. The words, they just don't come out so good all the time. Cross-examine is a verb... Cross-examiner is a noun. Do, 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 be, do, be, do. Next is cross-eye. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1826. One, strabismus, in which the eye turns inward toward the nose. What is strabismus? That is the question of the day. It is something where the eye turns inward towards the nose. Okay, so when this happens in people, is it just one eye that goes in? Is it both eyes? Is one more common than the other? Is it always one or the other? Uh, well, how does this happen? Why does this happen? Why do people get strabismus? Uh, can you fix it? I know sometimes glasses will fix it somehow. Is that true? I think it might be. Um, Yeah. I think one of my favorite examples of a character with cross eyes was uh, the character who was not cross-eyed anymore from Christmas Vacation. She was, and then she wasn't. It's a great little short moment. Uh, Okay, number two for cross eye. Uh, You you would say cross eyes here because it is eyes affected with uh, with cross eye. Cross eyes. Uh, you you know you're where you got to worry about if you if you make faces if you do that people say your eyes are gonna get stuck are they really gonna get stuck has that ever happened to anybody I don't think so I think I can cross my eyes a pretty pretty far amount yeah whoa okay um do 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 cross eyed that is an adjective one who is cross eyed boo boo doo boo 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 Next is cross-fertile, two words, with a hyphen, cross-fertile the turtle, adjective from 1929, fertile in a cross, or capable of cross-fertilization. Fertile in a cross, or capable. Okay, so uh, I'm figuring out how they wrote this. Fertile in a cross-fertilization, or capable of cross-fertilization. Something like that. Uh, what is that? So that would be um, like the cross, the cross breeds. Those would be uh, cross fertile, I think. And then, relatedly, our last word, badoo boop. It is cross fertilization. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1870. I wish I could figure out how to say these words backwards immediately like as soon as i say cross fertilization then i can say i can just say it backwards right there but in the meantime what i can do for you because i know you would love this is for me to just say cross fertilization and then play it backwards because that's more accurate anyway and then we'll go from there cross fertilization and she is a little noun from 1870 1a fertilization 
in which the gametes are produced by separate individuals or sometimes by individuals of different kinds. But 1B. Number 1 for the synonym cross-pollination. That will be two episodes from now. Number 2. Interchange or interaction. Uh, especially between different ideas, cultures, or categories, especially of a broadening of a broadening or productive nature. Interchange or interaction, especially of a broadening of productive nature. That was it for the words. Good job, everybody. So we had cross-check, cross-check, cross-claim, cross-country, cross-country, cross-court, Cross-cultural, cross-current, cross-cut, 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 saw, cross-cutting, cross-dressing, cross-cross-examination, cross-eye, cross-fertile, cross-fertilization. Hmm. I will pick, just because I love the etymology so much, cross, C-R-O-S-S-E. That shall be the word of the episode. I dub it to thee. The game where they throw the ball around in the basket is called lacrosse. It means the stick. Okay, that is going to be it for this episode. Uh, That was it. Also for page 298. Yay. What's going to happen next? I don't know. Um, Have we watched anything recently? Well, just a couple days ago, the whole Oscars thing happened. Don't feel like we need to chat about that. Everybody's given their opinions because I think all the social media feeds have been about half full with that. Memes, jokes, support, whatever. It's, you know, it is what it is. It just happened. Um, Hope people feel great about all their decisions is all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's it. We're just going to end it there. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And until next time... This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. How are you doing? Happy to see you guys. Hey, thanks for turning this podcast on. Is it, is, are you listening to this on an audio podcast platform thing or are you watching this on YouTube? You know, you can go watch it on YouTube. You're not going to have a whole lot to watch. It's just, uh, it's just a logo. But, um, maybe you can, uh, just, uh, Put on something else in the background. Uh, No, no, you got to do something visual and you can listen to this. Maybe doing the dishes. Maybe drawing. Maybe walking. Those are all things that you can do while you listen to this podcast. This is the top of page 299. Uh, I am looking at a poster we just got printed up for our the film that we are making, me and other lots of other people. It's called Unplugged. I have mentioned this. Um, we don't know when it's going to come out. It's a feature-length animated film that is great. It's going to be great. And uh, we got a poster printed up because we're going to um, a David Lynch retrospective event at the Music Box um, just because we're fans. Um, by the time this airs, that event will be long over. But um, we're going to be there saying hi. And um, a couple of people from Twin Peaks, which is from David Lynch, are um, they play characters in this film Unplugged. And so, you know, we, we're trying to, trying to promote the stuff and, and get, the, get the people interested. So we, we have a poster. It's very simple and cool and it's very odd to see something that you made up on a, on a big, big poster thing. Hey, let's talk about the words. You guys, there's so many crosswords. Oh, that's a that's a crossword too. When are we going to see that? In a couple of days. Okay, the first word in this episode is cross fertilize. Two words with a hyphen. Verb from 1876 starting with transitive. To accomplish cross fertilization of and then intransitive, to undergo cross-fertilization. And, uh, you know, you can go back to yesterday's episode to learn more about 
cross-fertile and cross-fertilization. So yeah, that was cross-fertilize. Next is a sound effect. Ah! Cross-file. That's our next word. Two words with a hyphen. File. F-I-L-E. This is a verb from 1949, starting with intransitive. To register as a candidate in the primary elections of more than one political party. And didn't we have something like that yesterday? Um, where was it? Cross, I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere around here, either yesterday or the day before, there was some crossword that had to do with politics. Or maybe it was just the word cross. One of those. Uh, okay, so that was to register as a candidate. You are the candidate, and you are registering um, in the primary elections of more than one political party. For some reason, you're allowed to do that. And then transitive, to register a person as a candidate for more than one party. So in the first case, I think you are the candidate. And in the second case, you are registering somebody else as the candidate. Ah! Next is crossfire, two words. And apologies for that probably scary sound effect. It probably just came out of nowhere. Okay, crossfire. Noun from 1799, 1A, firing, as in combat, from two or more points so that the lines of fire cross. Um, that would just be uh, people firing at each other, right? Isn't that crossfire? If you get stuck in the crossfire, you got people firing one direction and you got other people firing in the opposite direction. And you don't want to be in the middle of that. 1B, a situation wherein the forces of opposing factions meet, cross, or clash, as in caught in a political crossfire. I think there was a game when I was a kid called Crossfire, and you had, my friend had it, you had these little, it was like, um, it was a little table with, uh, with walls around it, and on each side, there was a little sort of gun kind of thing. And I think there were just little BBs, little metal balls. And you would shoot them. But what was the goal? Were you trying to get them in a goal? Or what What was it exactly? That's probably what it was. Crossfire. Maybe I'll find a uh, an old ad on YouTube for Crossfire, the game. Number two. Rapid or heated exchange of words. Those words are so heated. Okay, that's it for that. Ah. Next is cross-grained. I have a feeling this is about wood grain. Cross-grained is two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1647. One. Difficult to deal with. As in, her husband's self-absorbed and cross-grained nature. That is a quote from Lance Morrow, or Morrow, M-O-R-R-O-W. Difficult to deal with. Yeah, okay, you don't want, you don't want somebody to describe you as having a cross-grained nature. Two, having the grain or fibers running diagonally, transversely, or irregularly. But but to what? Having the grains or fibers running diagonally, transversely, or irregular to something. To what? To what? what's the normal thing? I mean, I guess it depends on the context. But it would be cross-grained. Ah! Next is crosshair. One word, noun from circa 1884. The... Pronunciation guide spells hair like H E R, and you're supposed to know that that's pronounced hair, although it sure looks like the word her to me. Okay, back to the words. Circa 1884. This is, wow, long definition. 
a fine wire or thread in the focus of the eyepiece of an optical instrument used as a reference line in the field or for marking the instrumental axis. And this is used figuratively to describe someone or something being targeted as if through an aiming device having crosshairs. Uh, so just the first part, um, it is just a very a, a small image of a, a crosshairs, something in, in anything that is optical. So if you put your eye through it in the eyepiece, there will be this uh, little, uh, it's a cross, you know, it's an X, it's a plus sign, and you use it as a reference to line something up. But how it is typically used is when you say that something or somebody is in the crosshairs as if someone is aiming something at them. We have a quote, dot, 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 is in the crosshairs this political season. That is a quote from J.H. Alter. And uh, J.H. was talking about something or someone that is in the crosshairs this political season. Um, it could it could be uh, it could be political ideas. It could be, you know, race, abortion, the police, foreign foreign policies. There are lots and lots of things that could be talked about that are in the crosshairs. Ah. Next is crosshatch. One word, a transitive verb from 1662, to mark with two series of parallel lines that intersect. Crosshatch is a noun, and crosshatching is a noun. It's also two words with a hyphen. To mark with two series of parallel lines that intersect. So, uh, artists do this a lot. If they want to do some shading, um, they'll do a, a bunch of lines that are parallel to each other, and then they'll do a bunch of lines that are parallel to each other, but are perpendicular to the original set of lines. And it has this very loose, kind of cool look. And depending on how uh, how dense the lines are, how many there are, all those, th- all those things, um, it, you will have it be either darker or lighter. You could use it to, uh, to create some shading. Maybe we should post a picture on social media of Crosshatch so you can see an example. Ah! Next word is crosshead. One word. Yeah, like the the head on the neck, crosshead, noun from 1827, one, a metal block to which one end of a piston rod is secured. This has got to be inside of a car engine is what I think. Two, a heading centered usually between portions of text. A heading centered usually between portions of text, so there's text over here and text over there, and then there's a big heading thing that's centered between them. Maybe um, maybe it's like in a magazine, and there's two or three columns of text, and then this heading is above them and centered. So that's the cross head. Designers, they know all about that stuff. <sighs> Next is cross index, two words with a hyphen, Transitive verb from 1892. One, to index an item under a second or under more than one heading. Cross index, you know, we're just, we're using this word cross to mean um, it can either be crossing a thing or it can be in multiple, it can be used in multiple areas. You know, the whole candidate for multiple parties. In this case, cross index. Uh, something can be filed under multiple places, multiple headings. Number two, to supply as a book with a cross-referenced index. Cross-index uh, is also a noun. I don't have a lot to say about that. Next. Oh. 
I, I, I don't know what these sound effects are. I'm just trying to keep it interesting and do something different. And so singing has sort of become the next thing, I guess. I don't know. We'll see where it goes. Okay, crossing is next. Cross with an I-N-G, noun from 1575. One, the act or action of crossing. That's what you're doing. You're crossing, so you're crossing. As 1A, a transversing or traveling across. What is the difference between transversing and traveling? Uh, No, actually, I take that back. It is not transversing. It is traversing. And I... Did I read that word wrong the last... uh, Whenever it came up before? Traverse? I'm trying to see if I can find where we had that. Uh, No, here, for cross-grained, it definitely did say transversely. So I think I'm okay. Whew, I got scared. Okay, so back to crossing. Uh, So that was... Uh, 1A, a traversing or traveling across. You would be crossing. Crossing what? Crossing water. Crossing land. I think that's it. 1B, an opposing, blocking, or thwarting, especially in an unfair or dishonest manner. Who? Oh. You don't you don't want to go be crossing. You don't don't cross me. 2A. A place or structure, as on a street or over a river, where pedestrians or vehicles cross, especially the synonym crosswalk. Sometimes you will see signs on a highway, on a road, that says, you know, animal crossing, deer crossing, moose crossing, turtle crossing, possum crossing, fish crossing. Maybe you won't see that one. But uh, yeah, this is an area where these animals like to cross the road for some reason. Um, And so you got to be careful. You don't want to hit them. That's a place or structure where things cross. To be the place in a cruciform church where the transept crosses the nave. And because it has to do with the church, I don't know anything about this. To see a place where a railroad track crosses a street. We got we got trains that uh, run not too far from where we live, and so we have to uh, cross these railroad crossings uh, often to to get to places nearby. Okay, next. Ah, it is crossing over. Two words with a hyphen, noun from 1912. This is an interchange of genes, G-E-N-E-S, or segments between homologous chromosomes. So the genes are passing stuff back and forth inside your body. Is this, uh, what is this, an interchange of genes or segments between homologous chromosomes? So are the chromosomes... Passing the genes. And is that when you are making a baby? Is that crossing over? No, I don't know. We we generally know what world we're talking about, but we do need more information. Ah! Next is cross-legged. Two words with a hyphen. You can say cross-legged, cross-legged, cross-legged. Legged or cross legged. Three syllables or two syllables. It is an adverb or adjective from circa 1530. One, with legs crossed and knees spread wide apart. I'm not very good about sitting, I can't sit in this position very well. My body is weird and not flexible. And I've just never been able to do it. I mean, I can do it okay, but I can't do it for long. And my back hurts because I can't just, I don't know. My body's all messed up. Um, so that that's that. Uh, what do people, people call this? Uh, they used to call it Indian style. I don't think that's maybe the best way. Uh, there's There are other terms. Um, oh, there's one that I have heard that I did not grow up with. So I can't think of what it is. 
but you know what it is. You you probably use it. I can't think of it. Cross-legged. It's just where your legs cross. People with only one leg, they can't k- sit cross-legged. They can sit leg bent, but that's it. Number two, with one leg placed over and across the other. You got to cross them legs. <laughs> Next is crosslet, noun from the 15th century. A small cross, usually with crossed arms, especially one used as a heraldic bearing. And it says to see the cross illustration, which we just went over recently. So to remind you, crosslet was number 18. And this is the one that's a cross, but then each of the lines has its own cross. Or it is its own cross. Uh, So yeah, a small cross, usually with crossed arms. It's crosses within crosses. Within crosses, within crosses. Ha! Next is cross-linguistic. This is one word. I am fascinated. I'm, I'm intrigued by this. What is this? Adjective from 1954 of or relating to languages of different families and types, especially relating to the comparison of different languages. Hmm. Cross-linguistically is an adverb. So, so it's relating to the, so you're comparing different languages or different types of languages or sub languages that from, you know, there's different versions of Spanish or there's different, um, oh, 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 can't think of the word, but different, you know, a country may have all the same language, but then they have different versions of it. Um, and so I guess that whole thing is cross linguistic. Yeah. Yeah. Next is cross-link. Two words with a hyphen, noun from 1936. A crosswise connecting part, as an atom or group, that connects parallel chains in a complex chemical molecule, as a polymer. Uh, okay, yeah, this is this gets into the world where my brain is like, what? A crosswise connecting part like an atom or group, that connects parallel chains in a complex chemical molecule. Yeah. All of the atoms are linked to make molecules, and then maybe they make a polymer, and they're all cross-linked together. Cross-link is also a verb. Wow! Next is cross-linkage. So we just added an A-G-E to the end. Noun from 1937. The process of forming cross-links. And then also just the synonym cross-link. So the creation of cross-links is cross-linkage. Ha! Next is cross-multiply. Two words. Verb from 1951. This is just intransitive, long definition. Here we go. To clear an equation of fractions when each side consists of a fraction with a single denominator by multiplying the numerator of each side by the denominator of the other side and equating the two products obtained. So... Let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. Uh, so there's, there's uh, how, how are we doing this? Um, you take the bottom number from a fraction and you multiply it to the top number on the other side of the equal sign. And then you do the same vice versa. You take the, the, the bottom number below the line on the right side and you multiply it to the num- number on the top above the line on the left side. And then you, you do some things, and it's a f- hunky-dory and fancy-fancy. Uh, yeah, cross-multiplication is a noun. You're multiplying... Uh, okay, so here's, here's another example. Um, if you were trying to figure out the percentage of a thing, uh, let's say we have the numbers 3 
and 16. Those are just the first numbers I could think of. What percentage is 3 of 16? Well, the way you do this is you write an equal sign to the right of 3, 16, 3 over 16, and then, uh, then you write x over 100 because that is the percentage you're trying to find. It's a percentage is out of 100. What is it? If 16 equals 100%, what percent is 3 of 16? So you multiply 3 times 100, and you get 300, and then you... See, this is a little bit more complicated than just cross-multiply, but it's we're, we're using the cross-multiply thing, so it, it works. So you take 300, and then you divide that by 16. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but you can do the math. Whatever number that is, that is the number that goes in the X spot. And that is the percentage that, that 3 is of 16. Does it make sense? Okay, great. Hey, now, it's your birthday. Ha! Last word for this episode is cross-national. Two words with a hyphen. Adjective from 1965 of or relating to two or more nations. Maybe if somebody has passports in two nations, they are cross-national. Maybe there's a law that was created that covers more than two or more nations, and that would be cross-national. I'm sure there's tons of other examples. Okay, so we have to read the words now. They were cross-fertilize, cross-file, cross-fire, cross-grained, cross-hair, cross-hatch, Cross head, cross index, crossing, crossing over, cross legged, cross lit, cross linguistic, cross link, cross linkage, cross multiply, and cross national. I will pick, um, I think the one that I enjoyed the most, just because it had to do with art, uh, was cross hatch. Cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, cross. That is a song that is inspired by how cross hatch looks. Um, I think that those are all the things that I got to say to you in this episode. I don't know if I have a whole lot of other stuff to say. Um, I am I am planning on watching that movie. That new movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, I think that's what it's called. That That's coming out, coming to my area very soon, so I'm going to watch it, and it looks fascinating. Okay, that's going to be the end. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Say It With Me Now, Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. That's what it is. It is this podcast, this thing where I am reading this book, and I am just also telling you my thoughts about the things um, that uh, just they, they just come to mind as I go. And who we we don't know what where it's gonna go, what's gonna happen, who knows? But we're all gonna have fun and enjoy it um, because it's it's gonna it's just not gonna last forever. It's gonna end someday. Um, and let's just have fun in the moment. Okay, the first word is Cross of Lorraine. Three words. Lorraine has a capital L, L O R R A I N E. And uh, we, if we look at our cross illustration from a handful of episodes ago, number three was Patriarchal or Cross of Lorraine. And then number five was also called Cross of Lorraine. Um, so yeah, that's what we're talking about, probably. So, Cross of Lorraine, circa 1889, doesn't say whether it's a noun or anything. It is a cross with two crossbars, the lower one of which is longer than the upper one and intersects the upright below its center. Uh, it is also the synonym patriarchal cross which we said. Okay, so, uh, yes, what they said is exactly right. There's two crossbars. The lower one 
is uh, longer than the upper one, but, so here's the difference between three and five. Number three, this is the one that's patriarchal or cross of Lorraine. The longer of these two cross beams, the lower one is pretty much right in the center, but for number five, it is pretty far down near the bottom. So that is how and why they are different. I mean, why they're different, I don't know, but that's how they're different. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a sound effect. I don't remember if I did this. I know that I said that I would maybe do it in a future one, but I don't know if I ever did it. So we're just going to do it here, and then maybe it's the second time I did it. It is... It's kind of like a... a, a, I was about to say a chipmunk. No, a cricket. Next word... How do we say this? It is crossopterygian. Crossopterygian. It's this great word. Uh, it is spelled C R O S S O P T E R Y G I A. Uh, y G I A N. I got it out. So I would urge you to pause this and see if you can figure out maybe what it means or what part of it means crossopterygian crossopterygian okay pause it now and we're back so this is a noun from 1861 oh by the way uh i forgot cross of lorraine it is from lorraine france that's all it tells me so the french people love that type of cross Okay, back to crossopterygian, noun from 1861, any of a subclass, crossopterygii, of bony fishes, as a coelacanth, that have paired fins suggesting limbs, just suggest them, that may be ancestral to the terrestrial vertebrates and that are mostly extinct. And then it is called also lobe fin. Uh, okay, crossopterygian is also an adjective. Uh, these are old fish. They're bony fishes. They have these paired fins that kind of seems like possibly limbs. Uh, maybe they're an early ancestor right just right before uh, they came out of the water. So, uh, yeah, crossopterygian. What does the etymology have to say? Uh, let's see. Should we do this backwards? There's more information at the word feather. Um, the word, the Greek word pteron, which means wing, is in there. Uh, let's see. You know what? I don't know if I like this whole backwards etymology thing. We're going to go back to the beginning of it. Um, so, the yes, the subclass name is crossopterygii from Greek krosoi, which means fringe, plus pterygian, which means wing or fin. So it's a, uh, a fringed fin, I think is what, that's what, what it means. Krosoi and pterygian is fringed wing or fringed fin, but in this case it's more likely a fin than a wing. But it is interesting that the the Greek word pteron, however you want to say it, I mean, it means wing, but it can be also used for fin. This was news to me. I think that is it for crossopterygian. Next is crossover. One word, first form, noun from 1884. One it is the number two A definition for the word crossing, which was in yesterday's episode. Two, an instance or product of genetic crossing over. And yeah, crossing over again was in yesterday's episode. Three, a voter registered as a member of one political party who votes in the primary of the other party. They're crossing the lines. They're crossing over the political lines 
because they like the person on the other side more than the people who are on their side. Which, you know, the why we've got this two-party system here in America and the fact that we label ourselves these things anyway in the first place is just kind of weird, but that's what we do. But clearly you can go vote for other people if you want. Vote for whoever you want. Just vote. Just do it. It's not that hard. Can we make voting day a national holiday, please? That that should have been done hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, all right. So number four for crossover, a broadening of the popular appeal of an artist that is often the result of a change of the artist's medium or style. Whoa, they changed it up. Also, an artist or artistic work that has achieved a crossover. Uh, By the way, an example of an artist, one of these artists could be a musician. Maybe it's a country musician who has crossed over into rock music or pop music or opera music. But that would be a crossover. What sort of crossover can I do? Five. An instance of breaking into another category. Well, if I made this a sports podcast, then I would be crossing over into another podcast category. But right now, we are in the, whatever this is, the education world, the sort of maybe comedy world, but it's more education than anything else, I think. Number six, a basketball maneuver in which a player dribbles the ball quickly from one hand to the other. Wow, that sounds... That sounds hard. Just pass the ball from one hand to your other hand? By dribbling? That's a crossover. Next is the second form of crossover, adjective from 1893. One, having two pieces that cross especially one over the other. Well, how else would they cross? Uh, As in, a crossover vest. Number two, it is the number one definition for the word critical, as in, the crossover point. At that point, you have crossed over from being not critical to being critical. The point of no return The point where things happen. Next is crossover, but this one is two words, so it's not technically the third form of crossover. Um, Verb, intransitive verb from 1973. To reach a broader audience by a change of medium or style. As in, a country singer crossing over to the pop charts. Uh, it's pretty much what we just talked about before. Didn't even know we were going to see that example. It's good when you can cross over into new things. You 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 gain a bigger fan base. Um, yeah, yeah. Next is cross ownership. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1969. Single ownership of two or more related businesses. Uh, Where's the end of the parentheses? Okay, let's try it again. Single ownership of two or more related businesses that allows the owner to control competition. Whoa. And examples of these uh, businesses could be a newspaper and a television station. So if somebody owns both of those things... Uh, they, they have, they have a cross ownership. Uh, they own these things that allow them to control the competition. And that's, that's leading into monopoly territory, isn't it? Next is cross patch. One word, noun from circa 1700. Hmm. And it's just the number two definition for the word grouch. Oscar the 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 cross patch what is this cross patch that's a grouch I don't know I never heard it before okay we're just gonna move on it is cross piece 
one word piece is spelled P-I-E-C-E, like a piece of pie. Noun from 1706, a horizontal member uh, as of a structure. So there's a structure, and it has a piece that goes horizontally, and so that would be a cross piece. That's literally what it is, a piece that it just crosses across. That's all it is. Does it have meaning? Does it have a purpose? Yes, probably. More than likely, it is a structural piece in the structure. Next is cross-pollinate. Two words with a hyphen. Transitive verb from circa 1900. To subject to cross-pollination. If you are if you do cross-pollinate, if you cross-pollinate a thing, you are subjecting it to cross-pollination, which is our next word. Cross-pollination, two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1882. One, the transfer of pollen from one flower to the stigma of another. Insects do this. Bees do this. Everybody, um, yeah, they go and they go sit on a flower and they gather up some stuff. They get some food. The pollen from the flower gets all sticky, sticky onto their butts and legs. They fly to another one. Some of the pollen falls off. The pollen does its thing. The flowers, they reproduce somehow. I still don't understand it. They make more flowers. So they are getting pollinated, cross-pollination, and uh, yeah. The bees are cross-pollinating the things. Number two, we have the number two definition for cross-fertilization, which was at the end of the episode two episodes ago. Uh, Oh, we have an example here. Cross-pollination of fantasy and realism. Mmm, that sounds like a a fun place to be. Fantasy and realism. What does that look like? Partially realistic, partially fantastical. Next is cross-product. Two words, noun from 1929. One, the synonym is vector product. Two, either... Of the two products obtained by multiplying the two means or the two extremes of a proportion. Uh, Okay, either of the two products. So products, uh, this is um, when you multiply two things, you get a product. That is what happens. So either of the two products obtained by multiplying the two means, those would be like the averages. When you multiply the Two averages of two sets of numbers, you get the cross product, I guess. Or you are multiplying the two extremes of a proportion. And then that is the cross product. The math people are digging it. Uh, Got to put some effort into it. Next is cross purpose. Two words, hyphen, noun, 1668. A purpose, usually unintentionally contrary to another purpose of oneself or of someone or something else. We shall read that again. A purpose, usually unintentionally contrary to another purpose of oneself or of someone or something else. And this is usually used in plural, as in, the two were always working at cross purposes. Uh, Just trying to understand this in my head. Purpose, usually, uh, whatever. I don't want to take up your time. So, moving on to the next one. Cross question. Two words hyphen, uh, noun from circa 1694, a question asked in cross-examination. 
That's when the lawyer talks to the person up on the thing, and they they cross examine him. Uh, they cross examine them with a cross question. Cross question is also a transitive verb. Next is a cross reaction. Two words with a hyphen noun from 1946. Reaction of one antigen with antibodies developed against another antigen. Cross-react is an intransitive verb. Cross-reactive is an adjective. And cross-react... How? Cross-reactivity, that is a noun. There was more to that word than I first suspected. Next. It is cross-refer. Cross-refer, R-E-F-E-R. Two words with a hyphen. Uh, It's a verb from 1879, starting with transitive. To refer a reader by a notation or direction from one place to another, as in a book, list, or catalog. So it is some sort of marking that tells the reader of whatever they're reading to go to another part of the thing that they're reading for some reason. Why would you do this? Would it be for a footnote? If you put a little star or a number and then it refers you to a footnote or maybe something in the appendix, would that be a cross-refer? Or that's the action of cross-referring, possibly? Well we can maybe give you a little bit more information because our next and last word, it is the first form of cross-reference. And we're going to see the second form tomorrow. So, cross-reference, two words with a hyphen, noun from 1834, a notation or direction at one place, as in a book or filing system, to pertinent information at another place. Um, yeah, I think like the appendix of a book or table of contents or something else, uh, that is where the pertinent information, maybe it's a glossary. Um, but then, yeah, there's some sort of notation or thing that says, go look in this other part for more information. Cross-reference. Okay, so we had today... Cross of Lorraine, Crossopterygian, Crossover, 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 Cross Ownership, Cross Patch, Cross Piece, Cross Pollinate, Cross Pollination, Cross Product, Cross Purpose, Cross Question, Cross Reaction, Cross Refer, and Cross Reference. I think, ooh, well, yeah, I shall pick crossopterygian because it's just a great, great word. And, uh, you know, the old fishes, the old fishes are the old fishes, and that's what they are. And uh, some are extinct, but not all of them. Some have come back. We didn't even know that they were not extinct. Crossop. Derigian, hey, how you doing? Cross up Derigian, hey. That's all I got for you today. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. Who knows what it's all about? Uh, Okay, so the first word in this episode is cross-reference. Two words with a hyphen. This is the second form. And this one is the verb form from 1902. Just transitive. One, to supply with cross-references. As in, cross-reference a book. 
So that that sentence, cross-reference a book, I would think that that would be you are cross-referencing, you are going to check another book for the reference, but I think in this case, it is the act of adding the cross-references to a book that have references. Number two, to research, verify, or organize by means of cross-references, as in cross-reference information. Do -de -do. Next word is cross-resistance, two words with a hyphen, noun from 1946, tolerance, as of a virus, to a usually toxic substance that is required, no, that is acquired, a usually toxic substance that is acquired not as a result of direct exposure, but by exposure to a related substance. Uh, and the example of the toxic substance is an antibiotic. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's break this down. Tolerance to a usually toxic substance that is acquired not as a result of direct exposure, but by exposure to a related substance. Something about viruses and antibiotics and you got resistance to the thing and the stuff. Uh, yeah, my brain is not processing great. Okay, do, do, do. Next word, crossroad. Uh, you can emphasize the first or the second syllable. Who says crossroad? I think it's just crossroad. Noun from 1686, one a road that crosses a main road or runs runs cross country between main roads. Yeah, there's those cross country roads, the country roads, aren't they aren't they lettered? There's R and double L. Uh those that's a cross road. It crosses the main roads. Number two, uh two A, the place of intersection of two or more roads. Where are you going to go? Which route are you going to take? 2B1, a small community located at such a crossroads. And if it's just a town on at one intersection, it's going to be a very, a very tiny community. 2B2, a central meeting place. Let's go meet at the crossroads. Well, which roads are you talking about? You know, those two. That's the only two that we have in this tiny community. Oh, yeah, that crossroads. Let's go meet there. 2C, a crucial point, especially where a decision must be made. You need to know, or you need to decide, what what route are you going to take at that crossroads? It's, you know, it's whatever whatever you decide, I'm sure, will be fine, but you just, you know... One of you, you can't just sit there forever, can you? Can you just sit at a crossroads? Do do do. Next is cross rough. Okay, so this is one word. Yes, it is the word rough, but it is spelled like the dog rough R U F F. Cross rough. Noun from 1862. A series of plays in a card game like bridge in which partners alternately trump different suits and lead to each other for that purpose. Uh, so they're, they're trouncing the other players. Par uh, partners alternately trump different suits and lead to each other for that purpose. So they are very good at this game, and they kind of know what the other person has, and they're saying, okay, I'm going to take this hand, and then the next, then they set their their partner up to win the next hand, and then that person sets their partner up for the next hand. They go back and forth, I guess. And why is it called a cross rough? It doesn't tell me. I mean, the crossing kind of makes sense. You're crossing, you usually sit across the way from each other. But the rough part, maybe you're making it very rough for the other players, but that should be spelled R-O-U-G-H, I think. So, you know, there's that. Doob doop boop. Next word is cross section. Two words. Noun from 1835. 1A. A cutting or piece of something cut off. 
<laughs> I don't know how to speak, a cutting or piece of something cut off at right angles to an axis, and then also a representation of such a cutting. It's been cut off at the right angles to an axis. I need to visualize this. 1B, it is the 3B definition for the word section, which makes sense because, you know, section is in this word, cross section. Number two, a measure of the probability of an encounter between particles such as will result in a specified effect as scattering or capture. Uh, a measure of the probability of an encounter between particles. Okay, I think I kind of know. There's a bunch of particles flying through the air, and if you just take a slice of it, it's a cross-section of the particles. I'm not sure. I'm sure I'm not getting this quite accurately, but scientists who deal with particles, they, they can explain much better what cross-section means in that. Number three, a composite representation typifying the constituents of a thing in their relations. A composite representation typifying the constituent. Okay, yeah, so it's very, it's worded kind of confusing, but it's basically um, a thing that represents all the things in a thing. <laughs> That's probably worse, right? Uh, so what's, what's the cross-section of the community? You know, the, the Wikipedia has this. There's like, oh, it's 45% this amount of people and 10% this amount of people. You know, that's that's sort of a cross-section. That's the idea of a cross-section, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Cross-section with a hyphen is a transitive verb. Cross-sectional, also with a hyphen, that is an adjective. Booby boop. Next is cross staff, two words with a hyphen, noun from 1582, an instrument formerly used at sea for taking the altitude of a celestial body. Uh, so it's not used anymore. I wonder if, uh, what's that? I think the, the uh, that other thing that was used for a long time is called a sextant, and it has to do with the horizon and the stars and the sun and I don't know how to use it because I never tried, was never trained on it. But this thing, I wonder if this is older than a sextant, but it uh, allows you to figure out how high something, how high something in the sky is, like a star or the sun, which is a star. I don't know what else, maybe the moon. I mean, technically maybe a planet, but they might as well be stars from our vantage point although they move differently than the stars so obviously that's different uh yeah so it's a cross staff never heard of one of these maybe we'll post a picture so we can see what it looks like i'm sure there's angles and stuff do 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 next is cross stitch two words with a hyphen noun from 1640 one a needlework stitch that forms an X. X, it's, it's X marks the cross spot. An X is a cross. Uh, so it's, yeah, if, if you need to do some needlework and you make an X, you have made a cross stitch. Number two, work having cross stitch. And cross stitch with, uh, still with a hyphen, is a verb. Now, you know, you can you can sew up clothes and use this stitch, but isn't this also the term for the thing when people make images and they use this cross stitch, I think? I don't know. Maybe if I find something, if, if it is what I think it is, maybe I'll post a picture somewhere. Uh, I got very behind on posting. I mean, you know, you hear this even further behind and then I get even further behind than that. But uh, yeah, you know, just, just wait a while and maybe... Maybe I will post a picture of this thing if you're really itching for it. Itching for the cross stitching. Boo, boo, doo, boo. Next is cross talk. Two words, noun from 1887. One, unwanted signals in a communication channel, as in a telephone, radio, or computer, caused by transference of energy from another circuit 
as by leakage or coupling. So the telephone signal, the radio signal, the computer... What's a computer signal? Um, anyway, they all have some sort of signal, and there can be an accident where other signals leak into your channel. Uh, you know, radio radio station, I guess it's possible that they could leak into each other. But can you? What, what's going on in the world when there's all these radio waves going, and there are different lengths, and it's, it's very... All the stuff that you can't see out in the sky... There's a lot going on. X-rays, radio signals, gamma rays, particles flying through the air, light waves and particles. We can't see any of it, but it's there's a lot going on out there. Anyway, there can be leakage. It's crosstalk. To a conversation that does not relate to the main topic being discussed. I also like to call that a tangent. Um... Yeah, you call that crosstalk. It's it's not the main thing. It's off to the side. It's being crossed at a 90-degree angle if you could visualize conversation that way. N- uh, to be conversation or repartee engaged in for an audience. I would also like to call that banter. Between songs, when a band is not uh, playing a song, maybe they have a little banter. I guess you could call that crosstalk. For me, crosstalk would also mean if I am sitting uh, at a table with some people or at a party or in a group of people and we're talking, um, I kind of need to focus on just one conversation and either partake in it or just listen because my brain cannot handle more than one thing at a time. And if somebody else starts talking to me, but I was already listening to this conversation, that's very hard for me to do. First of all, I'm probably interested in that conversation and may want to say something or at least want to learn something, and then now somebody has distracted me and wouldn't want to talk about something else. That can be hard. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but I'm sure there is. But also, if we're sitting at a table and there's four of us and I'm talking to the person at the diagonal and then the other two people are talking at the diagonal, we are literally cross-talking And that's weird and confusing. And then you're like, wait, 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 wait. Let me switch seats. We can have a quiet conversation here, and you can have a quiet conversation there, and then we're not distracting each other. But mostly, I just want everybody to talk about the same thing together. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, Next is cross-tolerance. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from circa 1923, cross tolerance or tolerance. Tolerance or resistance to a drug that develops through continued use of another drug with similar pharmacological action. So if you've got a a, a drug or something that is being put into your body a lot, uh, wait, no, but this is dealing with two different things. Tolerance or resistance to a drug that develops through... So if you're using a drug, but then you're using another drug, and because of the use of the second drug, you get more uh, resistant to the first drug because of the second one. Doctors got to be very careful about that. So I guess that's cross-tolerance. Do-do-do. Next is cross-town. One word. Adjective from 1886. One, situated at opposite points of a town, as in cross-town schools. So school at one end of the town, a school at the other end, and that's why they're cross-town schools. Um, in Chicago, there are two baseball teams. One is on the north side, one is on the south side. So when they play, it is called the Crosstown Classic, I think. Yes. The Crosstown Classic, because they're they're the teams that play a Crosstown, um, you know, one travels to one stadium, and then when they play again, the other one travels to the other stadium. Number two, although would you call those stadiums or just fields? Number two, extending or running across a town, as in a Crosstown street, also a Crosstown bus. I gotta get cross town. 
I'm going to go take that bus on that street to go from one school to the other across town. Do 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 do. Next is cross trade. T R A D E. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from circa 1923. And it is just the number 14 definition for the word cross, which is a security transaction in which a broker acts for both buyer and seller. So that is cross-trade. Boo-boo-boo. Next is cross-train, T-R-A-I-N. Maybe this will take you from one of those schools to the other across town, across train. Okay, two words with a hyphen. Verb from 1903, starting with intransitive. To engage in various sports or exercises, especially for well-rounded health and muscular development. Obviously, not the choo-choo train. It is the, oh my god, I'm tired train from uh, doing all these different kinds of working out. I need to do more of this. I need to work out more in general, but uh, yeah, more cross-training is probably a good idea. Okay, transitive. To train an employee to do more than one specific job. Very different. Usually when we have an intransitive and a transitive, they're in the same world. It's just that one thing is happening to something and the other one is, the thing is doing it to the other thing or something. But in this case, cross-train, when it's intransitive, you are cross-training your body. But in the transitive, somebody is training you to do multiple jobs very different worlds cross training with a hyphen is a noun Mm -hmm -hmm. next is cross trainer two words hyphen there's that hyphen in we've had it in so many words in this episode noun from 1987 it is a sport shoe designed for cross training You can run in it. You can do other things in it. What do you do? Weightlifting. All the things. Maybe you can learn lots of jobs when you're wearing your cross trainers. Do, 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 do. Next is cross trees. One word. Yeah, like trees. Trees that grow from the ground. This is a noun from 1626. Two horizontal cross priests cross pieces of timber or metal that spread the upper shrouds of a ship in order to support the mast. Uh, let's see. Cross. Pe- oh, yes. So they support the mast. The mast goes up and then, yeah, it's got the pieces that go across and don't they put the sail on those pieces? I don't know my boats very well. Yeah, spread the upper shrouds of a ship. I think that must be the sail. I think I don't know. I I only know I only know boats from movies. Uh, yeah, they're cross trees because they're probably you know pretty close to the size of a tree. They just hack a tree down and then just put it up. Probably take the bark off. Not a whole lot, but they're crossing the mast. Do 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 do. Next is cross vault. Two words. Noun from 1850. A vault formed by the intersection of two or more simple vaults. Okay, this is not the vault in a bank. This is the vault that I think gymnasts use, a vault formed by the intersection of two or more simple vaults. It is called also cross vaulting. They've got, I, I don't know which ones are vaults, which is such a strange word, uh... I know that there's the bars, the, the the uneven bars that they'll do things on. There's the thing where they jump off the little horsey thing and that. But are any of those vaults? I don't remember what, what vaults are. But you combine two or more simple vaults and you get a cross vault. Maybe we'll have to post a picture of that one too. We got one more for this episode. do do doo Crosswalk. One word. Noun from 1671 a specially paved or marked path for pedestrians 
crossing a street or road. It's a place where the people want you to cross the street, probably for safety reasons, make it all, all the crossing happen at one place instead of all throughout the street. But it depends on the country. Some places don't really do this. Some, peop- some places are very strict about this. Uh, it's the crosswalk. It could what what does it look like? It could be uh, diagonal lines to mark the crosswalk. It could be horizontal lines. It could just be two parallel lines going from one side of the street to the other. There are there are lights. There are sounds. Different places have different things. There could be a countdown. There could be in the lights. There could be pictures of a person of a bike. In uh in London, I think they even have horses because. They got people, what, like cops and stuff on horses. I think there's a whole other light system and up high things for them. And uh, yeah, like I said, countdowns, so many things and crosswalks. And I think that is it for this. Wait, did I? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that is it. Okay, so the words in this episode were cross-reference, cross-resistance, cross-road, There's a crosswalk and a crossroad, Uh, cross rough, cross section, cross staff, cross stitch, cross talk, cross tolerance, cross town, cross trade, cross train, cross trainer, cross trees, cross vault, and crosswalk. Hmm. 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 I'm thinking either crosswalk or crossroad. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but I didn't pick one. Let's pick Crossroad as the word of the episode. Sometimes people are at a crossroad and they gotta decide what to do. That is it for this episode. Can you believe that we made it to the end of it somehow? Okay, that is it. Thank you very much for listening to this. I do sincerely mean that. And, oh, uh, you know, th- th- now you don't know, but now you do know, as I'm about to tell you. Um, I started um, a tea public thing. I put up uh, just the two the two logos for this, um, this podcast, the square logo and just a simple horizontal one. I'm going to work on some other designs in the future. But you can go, I'll put a link in the show notes, you can go to Public dot com find my storefront and uh you can buy shirts and stickers and magnets and mugs and phone cases and all those things um with this uh podcast logo on it so if you really 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 love this podcast for some reason i don't judge you i love you you can show your love for it with merchandise because that is what this world is all about. Uh, No, but seriously, if you want to go buy something, that would be great, and I would appreciate that, Um, and it would make me happy. So that's where I'm going to end this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, all of you excellent word nerds. Welcome to this episode of The Dictionary. It is my podcast where I am reading this book, and I tell you what I think about the things as I come across to them. Come across? No, there's no T at the end. I come across them, which is very appropriate because we are finishing up the cross section. And, uh, oh, I got off track. Um, yes, it's, I tell you the things that I think about and stuff from my brain, which can go in any sort of direction. And I hope you enjoy it. And you can follow me on social media at DictionaryPod. Email me, dictionarypod at gmail.com. There is a Patreon for this podcast. You can give a few bucks a month and get episodes very early. And uh, you can call the Google Voice number and leave a message that I can listen to. And then maybe I'll put it in an episode so other people can listen to it. And there is a brand new merch page on tpublic.com. And ooh, is there anything else? I think that might be it for now. Uh, you you know, go find this on whatever podcast platform you like and go tell the people about it. You can go listen to it on YouTube if you want and subscribe and hit the buttons, all those buttons. 
on those things. All right, this is going to be the last section of page 299. The first word is crossway. One word, noun from the 14th century. This synonym is just crossroad. And uh, this is often used in plural, the crossways. We, we, have, we have come to a crossways. Oh, funny. That is actually our next word. And what am I going to do for a sound effect? I've been doing these musical things. We, we'll just do... do do do. Okay, crossways is next. Adverb from 1564. And the synonyms are crosswise and diagonally. Now, we had before, I think, crabwise. I don't know why they didn't list that here in the synonyms, but I think crabwise also sent us to crosswise and maybe crossways. But it's just it's just a way to go at a diagonal. Crossways. Um yeah. Doo doo doo. Next word is crosswind. This is one word, crosswind, noun from circa 1641, a wind blowing in a direction not parallel to a course. And this is talking about possibly an airplane, but also boats, I believe, get affected by crosswinds, mostly airplanes, though, because they're way up high in the sky, and there's a lot more wind out there. So... If they're, if the plane is trying to go left to right, but then there's, uh, no, that's not helpful. A plane is going in the direction it's going to go. And then there's a wind that is going across their direction. It's, it, the, the wind would be going left to right or maybe at a diagonal across ways. And, uh, it, it, the wind is trying to push them off course. I think we just had, there was another word like that recently, but, that's what that is. Um, oh, yeah, crab. It was back to crab. Uh, I just listened to that episode today, and uh, it was, uh, you got to crab, you got to crab the plane because the the crosswind is pushing it in the wrong direction. So you got to, you got to counteract that. You got to steer the plane towards the wind. So when it pushes the plane by the wind, it will become back on track. None of that was actually English. I am so sorry. Doo-doo-doo. Next is crosswise. One word. This was one of the synonyms for crossways. So crosswise, one word, first form, adverb, 14th century. One is archaic, and it is in the form of a cross. Crosswise in the form of a cross, but it is archaic. Number two, so as to cross something, and the synonym is across, as in carrot sticks cut crosswise. Uh, across, well, you, you cut them across, but you can do it at a diagonal too, right? You can cut carrot sticks however you want to cut carrot sticks. I'm not here to tell you how to cut carrot sticks. But you often probably will cut them crosswise. Next is the second form of crosswise. Adjective from 1883. One synonyms are transverse and crossing. Two, involved in conflict or disagreement. As in, got crosswise with his teacher. Mm, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, depending on what the teacher is saying or doing, maybe sometimes it's appropriate. But if you're just being a little butthead, maybe don't just randomly get crosswise with your teacher. You're, you're going to get sent to the principal's office. Um, but, yeah, you know, depends on the situation. I can see both sides. I, have, I don't think I've ever gotten crosswise with a teacher. I was not that kind of kid, for sure. Boo-doo-doo. 
Next is crossword. Word nerd. Word nerds usually like crosswords. This is a noun from 1914. It's just one definition. It's pretty long. Well, it's, it's medium length. It is a puzzle. Do I even need to describe to you what a crossword is? I shall. It is a puzzle in which words are filled into a pattern of numbered squares in answer to correspondingly numbered clues and in such a way that the words read across and down. Yeah, that's how they work. Crossword puzzles. Uh, I am, I'm not great at these, but I have done them off and on for a lot of my life. Like if I'm hanging out with my parents, they always do the Sunday crossword and, uh, you know, it, they're, they're pretty good at it, but, um, but I'll, I'll co- sometimes come in and help and it's sort of a family thing. Uh, so ooh, maybe even today I'm going over to see them today. Maybe we'll do the crossword. Um, okay. A long, long time ago, I had a guest on he T I think his name was T Campbell. You can go find the episode. Maybe if I feel like it, I will put the uh, the episode number in the show notes. Um, but he makes crosswords, if I'm remembering correctly. He makes giant crosswords. And um, yeah, let's go. Let's go uh, support his crossword making skills. There's crossword competitions. There's like the World Universe Crossword Championships, I think. And uh, yeah. The more you do them, the better you get because they use a lot of the same words and same clues um, if they need something. You know, there's those very few uh, rare words that are like a vowel, then a consonant, then a vowel, and they get used often or, you know, weird weird little words like that. Um, Yeah, crosswords are good. It's a good way to work your brain. I'm not great at them, but they're fun. I can do the easy ones. 1914. Supposedly that's when they were made. Was that when the first crossword was made? I wouldn't be surprised. Did anybody celebrate the 100th anniversary of crosswords? Do-do-do. Next is crostini. Noun from 1945. Small slices of usually toasted bread topped with a spread or other food. What might that other food be that's not a spread? Olives? Uh, This is Italian. We haven't had etymology for a little while. Uh, This is Italian. It is the plural of crostino, which is from crosta, which means crust or rind, R-I-N-D. It is from the Latin crusta, which means shell or crust, and there is more at the word crust. Usually not a word that I particularly like, unless it is talking about toasted bread. Uh, yeah, you, you toast it up. Uh, I'm imagining just little sort of ovally shaped pieces of bread for maybe like a French bread. And then you put some olive oil on it and bake it up. It's real good. The crostinis, tasty, tasty. Do do do. Okay, so we went we went from uh let's see, well cross crossways crosswise all those, then we went into puzzles, then we went into bread. Now we are going into something else. This is, there's a lot of a lot of different stuff in this episode. The next word is crotch, C R O T C H, noun from 1563. One, a pole with a forked end. Used especially as a prop. Uh, I was not expecting that. A pole with... Wasn't that a crutch? Not a crotch? Wait a minute. Is that not a a crutch? See, now I don't even know how to say the word. Anyway, I've always called that a crutch, but I guess you could also say crotch. That's number one. Number two is an angle formed by the parting of two legs, branches, or members, and crotched with an ed, that is an adjective. Um, 
Yeah, so the etymology does say this is probably an alternative of the word crutch. So that makes sense for number one. Number two, I mean, you know, I think what most people, when they think of the word crotch, they think of the part of a human body where the legs split off into the leg. Where the legs start, that's where the crotch is. And uh, But more specifically, as I said, it is an angle formed by the parting of two legs, branches, or members. So what context would that also be used in an angle? That is fascinating. I am surprised it does not say, you know, slang. The part of the human body that we all have and giggle about because we're all children at heart. Uh, okay, let's move on to... Do-do-do. Crotchet. Noun from the 14th century. One is obsolete. So first we have one A. A small hook or hooked instrument is a crotchet, but it is obsolete, so we don't know what that is anymore. 1B, this synonym is brooch, and it is spelled B-R-O-O-C-H. And I guess a brooch does have a hook on it, so that's probably why it's related to number 1A, but again, it is still uh, obsolete. They used to call it a crotchet. 2A, a highly individual and usually eccentric opinion or preference. Uh, An opinion or preference that is highly individual. Um, I mean, I know people are crotchety, which we will get to next, but a opinion or preference is a crotchet. 2B, A peculiar trick or device. That is also a crotchet. Never knew. What would a peculiar trick or device be? Mm, I mean, would TPing a house be a peculiar trick? Peculiar, though. That means it's more like odd. What is an odd trick that's called a crotchet? Okay, number three. The synonym is quarter note. Like, literally, the in music, the quarter note is called a crotchet? None of these definitions make any sense to me whatsoever. We have a synonym for everything. It is the word caprice. C-A-P-R-I-C-E. Looks like cap rice. Okay, the etymology is not helpful. It basically just says there's more at the word crocket. I mean, they do sound similar, crotchet and crocket, and, uh, you know, you can go back to that one. Uh, When was that? That was crocket. Um, The episode, it looks like it aired on, no, May, May 1, May 1st, was crocket. Okay, so back to today. Um, Crotchet... That was it for that one. Now we have crotchety. So we, we took crotch, and then we added an E-T, and it became crotchet, and then we added a Y, and it became crotchety. Adjective from 1825, one, given to crotchets, and also subject to whims, crankiness, or ill temper. And I think given two crotchets, that would be the one that is a highly individual and usually eccentric opinion or preference, I believe. If somebody has eccentric opinions or preferences, somebody can call them crotchety, as in a crotchety old man. I definitely think I will become a crotchety old man. Hopefully a very, very long time from now. What will happen in my life until that moment? What experiences will I experience, and why will I become crotchety? That is the big question. Two, full of or arising from crotchets, as in a crotchety style. Okay, what is that? Uh, Full of or arising from crotchets. Are these peculiar tricks or devices? Possibly. 
mm, a crotchety style? I don't know. Maybe it's just quarter notes. Bum, 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 bum. That is a crotchety style. Crotchetiness. Crotchetiness. That is a noun. Oh, that old man, he's got so much crotchetiness. All right, next word. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. It is croton. C R O T O N. Croton. Or maybe just croton. Noun from 1751. One. Any of a genus of herbs, shrubs, and trees of the spurge family as 1A. One of the Bahamas yielding. Ca- yielding cascarilla bark or cascaria bark. And just real quick, let me back up. The genus name is also Croton. And the species name of this one in the Bahamas that yields cascarilla bark is Croton eleutheria. We also have 1B, an Asian plant yielding Croton oil. And the scientific name, species name is Croton tiglium. Number two, any of a genus of shrubs and trees related to the crotons. And the genus name there is Codiamium. Whoa, there is four vowels in a row. All five vowels are in this word, and four of them are next to each other. Codiamium. Codiamium. It is spelled C-O-D-I-A-E-U-M. Maybe it would be codium. Oh, please, somebody tell me how to say this word. Um, Okay, so it's a plant, herbs, shrubs, trees, spurge family, cascarilla bark. I'm just highlighting these things, croton oil. Um, And then the etymology, it is from Greek, Croton, croton, croton. Uh, That means castor oil plant. So I guess it's related to the castor oil plant. Next is croton bug. And croton here is spelled with a capital C. Noun from 1877. This synonym is German cockroach. Uh, I'm sure there's there's some jokes in there about what makes a cockroach German. They, I don't know. So that's what that is. A croton bug is a German cockroach. This is from the Croton River in New York. Now, is it actually the river or is there a town called Croton River? Either way, it's in New York. And it is, oh, yes, it is a river because... It is used as a water supply for New York City. And how that became related to bugs, cockroaches, I one can only imagine. Are there lots of these cockroaches living in the river? And then it is used as the water supply for New York City? Is that why New York City has so many cockroaches? Hmm. Learn something new every day. Do 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 do. Next we have croton oil. Uh, which where which one had croton oil? Um, the Asian plant, croton tiglium. It yields croton oil. So that's what this is. Noun from 1827. A viscid acrid fixed oil obtained from seeds of an Asian croton, croton tiglium, formerly used as a powerful purgative, but now used, especially in pharmacological experiments, as an irritant. Croton oil irritates you because it is a viscid acrid fixed oil. Acrid sounds bad. Uh, yep. What sort of pharmacological experiments do they use this in? Do they make people's skin irritated and then they use something else to see if they can fix it? 
croton oil. You might want to stay away from it, is what I'm gathering. Okay. Do do do. Next is crouch. C R O U C H. Verb from the 14th century, starting with intransitive 1A. To lower the body stance, especially by bending the legs. As in, a sprinter crouched, ready to go. If you are lowering your body stance, how else would you lower it if not to bend the legs? Isn't How else would you do it? I don't know any other way. 1B. To lie close to the ground with the legs bent. As in, a pair of cats crouching on the brink of a fight. And that is a quote from Aldous Huxley. And uh, so is this when uh, cats, is it, let's see, they've got four legs that they can bend. So which legs are we talking about? I would imagine their front legs are low down and bent and their back legs might be up like they're ready to pounce. Uh, that is that is the only thing I can think of in terms of cats crouching, getting ready to fight. But the definition is to lie close to the ground with the legs bent. Yeah. Two, to bend or bow servilely. 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 Like in service. Hmm. But the synonym is the word cringe. Cringe? You know, maybe we had a different definition to cringe than the one that I think of. I have read so many words. I cannot keep anything straight. I can't remember... You know, anything that's like not already ingrained in my brain, I have a very hard time remembering those things. So cringe, uh, there's the cringing act. A servile bow, yes, is a cringe. Uh, to drunk, da, da, da. But I'm just reading through the definitions. To shrink in fear, to shrink in fear or serv- servility. Okay, that that is another way to use cringe. Shrinking in fear, like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, here, I am in service to you. That is cringing. So that is also crouch. Number three, to stand at a low height. As in, cottages crouched along the river. And now I just want to see a picture of cottages with legs crouching along the river, maybe to drink some water. We have one transitive definition, which says to bow especially in humility or fear. And the synonym is bend. You bend at the waist. Crouch is also a noun. Next is the first form of the word croup, C-R-O-U-P. And this is our last word, but we also do have the second form. And there are no forms in tomorrow's episode. So, croup, noun from the 14th century, it is the rump of a quadruped. (laughs) I did not know that. I wonder if when we had the cow illustration, was, was, uh, was croup part of there? Uh, let's see. I don't remember it. (laughs) Just reading through the stuff real quick. So, there's the crops, but that's not at the, that's not the rump. Um... Well, I'm not seeing it, but it might be. But anyway, you know, quadrupeds, they got there there is the rump. 37 is the rump. Doesn't say doesn't say croup. But any quadruped, you can go up to it and say, "Hey, look, that is the croup. It's the rump." Uh, let's see. Middle English croup from Old French of Germanic origin, akin to the Old High German kropf, which is craw. C-R-A-W, and there is more at the word crop. Last word, second form of croup, noun from 1765. This is the one that I think most people think of when they hear the word croup. It is inflammation, edema, and subsequent obstruction of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi, especially of infants 
and young children that is typically caused by a virus and is marked by episodes of difficult breathing and hoarse metallic cough. Croupy is an adjective. Sounds pretty terrible. I don't know if I ever had this when I was a kid. So uh, what what virus causes it? What can you do? Are there are there antibiotics? Um, yeah. So this is from the English dialect word croup. That's the word. That means to cry hoarsely or cough. So I think it just it it just was from an English dialect that they they called it croup because of the sounds that are made and the coughing, and then it just became the name of the thing. I wonder if there's a more scientific name, though. Okay, today's episode, the words were crossway, crossways, crosswind, crosswise, no, uh, yes, crosswise, crosswise, crossword, crostini, crotch, crotchet, crotchety, croton, croton bug, croton oil, crouch, croup, and croup. I am going to pick crossword as the word of the episode, and it's across. It's the word that's across. Um, hmm. A song about crossword. A song about crossword. There's there's so many different options, so many ways. It's not like I'm going to make anything good. One across. Is a crossword? No, I don't know what the hell this is. Honestly, there's a very good chance that when I get to the D's, which is coming up real quick, I might make this a not family-friendly podcast because I think it would be much better for my brain if I could just swear whenever I wanted to because that's sort of how my brain works. If you please, if you have strong opinions on that, let me know. And I may listen to you or I may not. Um, Crossword crossword what's one across what's one down they're crossing to each other and they are words they're part of a crossword what's the theme of the crossword i don't know you gotta finish it up to find out the theme is it 15 by 15 there's white spaces and black spaces it's kind of like chess but for words all right i'm gonna end this episode there thank you very much for listening And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Oh, hello, word nerds. Fancy meeting you here at the podcast. Uh, Okay, hello. How are you? Uh, Just a couple of days ago, we went to... Well, let me start by saying I have a drink with me. It is... I'm acting as if you can see me, but there is no camera. Uh, I bought this... What is it? fudge bites cookie dough soda something totally ridiculous and disgusting sounding i had to try it i got a few other ones we were at this amazing candy store in saint charles illinois after going to um, an amazing creepy store also in saint charles illinois the creepy store is called ghoulish mortals and i highly recommend it and uh then we went to this candy store that has a ton of candies and a ton of sodas, things like butter flavored and mustard flavor, and I'm not quite adventurous enough yet, but I am adventurous enough to try cookie dough bites and peanut butter and chocolate peanut butter, and I'm sure some of you are gagging right now, but um, I had to try them. I had to try them. So I have this cookie dough one right now. It is uh, just about what you would expect ridiculously sweet and also soda chemical flavored so you know i think once is enough and then i'm good i don't i don't need to have another one uh okay you know instead of that maybe we should talk about the words because that is obviously the reason we are all here today okay the first word on this uh top of page 300 is croupier or croupier because it is a French word, C-R-O-U-P-I-E-R, croupier. That is the better way to say it. It is a noun from 1709. Okay, we're going to try to be slow this time. We talk too fast usually. Let's be slow and chill. 
This is an employee of a gambling casino who collects and pays bets and assists at the gaming tables. They, uh, they work for money. Big money. Croupier, French. It literally means rider on the croup of a horse. The rider... Okay, now I don't remember what we talked about yesterday. Croup. So let us remind ourselves. Um, oh, the rump of a quadruped. <laughs> so the croupier... Whoa. I bet croupiers at, at casinos don't know the etymology of their job title. The rider on the croup of a horse. It must be the rider on the rump of a horse. So, oh my God, what I what is even happening here? An employee of a gambling casino who collects and pays bets. They they basically they're they're doing the dirty work, right? They're collecting and paying bets. It's just they got to do a lot of work at the casino. So, they're there's something about riding the rump of a horse. Wow, that's fascinating. I want to know the story about what happened. Just how that name came to be. Okay, so first of all, we need a sound effect. We'll do slurp. I think I did that once before, maybe. I don't know. This is getting so difficult. Mm. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I think too hard. That's the problem. When you don't think, then it's just gold. That'll be the sound effect. That's a very good sound effect, actually. Next is Cruz, C-R-O-U-S-E, adjective from the 15th century. It is chiefly Scottish, and the synonyms are brisk and lively. Cruz, I would like to hear this in a sentence. I'm pretty sure I've done something very similar to this before. Next is... I think you would say crustad. Crustad. You sound very fancy when you say crustad. C R O U S T A D E. Noun from circa 1845. It is a crisp shell, as of toast or puff pastry, in which to serve food. So you are serving food inside of this crisp shell, which is called a Crustad. Would a taco be a crustad? Have we been calling them the wrong thing all this time? Toast? You could serve food in a crisp shell made from toast. Also, a puff pastry, which sounds real good. Uh, let's see. Okay, French, probably from Italian crostata, which means tart. From crosta, which means pastry shell, or crust. And there's more of the word crust. We're we're getting there. We're getting to crust. Don't worry. Uh, I know we've had a number of words sort of talking about crust a bit recently. Okay. Next is crouton. You could also say... uh, Wait. What is the difference with crouton or cru... See, I still don't know the difference between the two dots and the line. I can't tell. Uh, You know what? It's just emphasizing either syllable. That's all it is. Crouton, crouton. Not sure if that worked. Noun from 1806. A small cube of toasted or crispy fried bread. I I think I was a bit of a crouton fiend when I was a kid. I still love them. You can't not love croutons. Okay, French, crouton, diminutive of croute, which means crust. Um, that's, that's the same, similar stuff to the last word. Next is crow, the bird crow. This is the first form, noun from before the 12th century. One, any of various large, usually entirely glossy black passerine birds... Uh, th- those are of the family Corvidae, and especially the genus Corvus. It's bringing us back to our Corvid days. Number two is capitalized. So 2A is a member of an American Indian people of the region between 
the Platte and Yellowstone Rivers. I forgot to mention that the bird definition had a whole bunch of adjectives. Glossy, black, passerine, I don't know, it's not a whole lot. Uh, okay, so number 2B, so we talked about the Crow people, American Indian people. Um, and then, okay, between the Platte and the Yellowstone Rivers. Well, so I assume the Yellowstone River is in Yellowstone, which is, I always forget this, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, one of those states. They're all the same. No, they're not. That's just a joke. Um, so between there and the Platte, I would, my, my first guess is Platte would be Wyoming. I don't know if that's true, but that's a guess. So uh, they lived, the Crow people lived in that area of maybe Colorado, uh, Oregon, what did I say? No, Utah, Oregon's somewhere else. Uh, Wyoming and maybe Nevada, those four, over there. Okay, 2B is the language of the Crow people. Makes sense. The Crow would speak Crow. 3, also capitalized, the synonym is Corvus. And we talked about that before. Number four, the synonym is humble pie, as in the braggart was forced to eat crow. If you don't, I mean, I guess humble pie makes more sense, but these are just sort of odd words for things we say or part of things we say. Um, is that, oh, interesting. Is that, um, okay, so the idea of the braggart was forced to eat humble pie, that means, you know, instant karma, they were bragging and then something bad happened to them, or they were made to look like a fool, something like that. Isn't that humble pie? I think it is. So, did that somehow turn into, isn't there a story about crows in a pie? So, I think that is maybe why it became eat crow. What a fascinating evolution there. There is a phrase, as the crow flies, and that means in a straight line. And I don't know why, but I always think it's funny when people say this phrase. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just kind of a silly phrase, isn't it? So just to hear a, an adult human say it just is sort of silly to me. I don't think I would ever say it. Okay, but I understand the concept. Maybe we should make a new phrase. No, that one's fine. Uh, let's see, crow, Old High German krawa, which means crow, uh, from Old English krawan, which means to crow. So uh, crow just means crow. There's no, there's no other other word. It's just crow. Second form of crow is a verb from uh, before the 12th century. It's showing some additional information. What does this say? Crowed, and then also in sense one, chiefly British crew. I think those are the past forms of this one. Uh, so crowed would be the past form, but for the number one definition, which is chiefly British, the, the plural there would be crew. Well, that's the first one, so let's talk about that first. Um, this is intransitive, by the way. One. Remember, the plural is crew. To make the loud, shrill sound characteristic of a cock. I guess, yeah, when the cock crows. Is not is that what they say? It's funny that there are two birds that can make the same sound. It's not the same sound at all, but it's called the same thing. Two, to utter a sound expressive of pleasure. Uh, what would that sound be? <laughs> Not, I don't even want to try. Number 3A, to exult gloatingly, especially over the distress of another. Very different context than number two. To utter a sound expressive of pleasure... And, well, no, actually, not they're not that different. And also, to exult gloatingly. You're, you're in pleasure when you're gloating, um, but specifically over the distress of another. I am crowing over your dead body. No, I don't know. If, yeah, okay. 3B, 
to brag exultantly or blatantly, pretty similar to 3A. And then transitive is to say with self-satisfaction. I'm self-satisfied in myself because I'm gloating over this, the distress of another. And a synonym is the word boast. Yep, that sounds like it's pretty accurate. You know, sometimes there's not a lot to say about words. Okay. Third form of crow is a noun from the 13th century. One, the cry of the cock. Isn't that... Oh, no, the other one was the verb. Uh, the, the act of making the loud, shrill sound characteristic of a cock. This one is the actual sound of the cock. Number two... A triumphant cry. Crow, I got a crow. I'm not going to do that at like full volume. That would be ridiculous. Next. It is crowbar, noun from 1748, an iron or steel bar that is usually wedge shaped at the working end for use as a pry or lever or lever. Crowbar is also a transitive verb. Uh, what did I have to say? A w- it's wedge-shaped at the working end. What is the side, the end called, that is not the working end? Maybe it doesn't have a name. But oh, you're going to get the working end of this wedge-shaped bar. Uh, I heard see- Oh, these, these are so good. I remember this was probably when I was a kid, one of the first tools that an adult will let you use in at least certain circumstances. I mean, you're dealing with nails, I guess, but, you know, it's not like it's a hammer or a drill uh, or a saw. <laughs> but yeah, crowbar. You feel pretty good when you... you it's, a, it's a good... It's, it's a very good use of physics. Physics people will say the... the, the what's it called? The crowbar is a very... Perfect example of physics at work. Deet, 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 deet. Crowd is next. First form, verb from before the 12th century. Starting with intransitive. I think I forgot to go slow. Let's, let's just take a breath. Oh, you know what? Now would be a good time to have a sip of this wonderful cookie dough drink. Mmm. Tastes like sort of cookie dough. Okay. 1A for crowd to press on. And the synonym is hurry. Hurry, hurry. Uh, Okay. 1B to press close. As in the players crowded around the coach. Oh, the coach must have been giving a very inspirational speech They're pressing very close, shoulder to shoulder. Maybe some are getting down on their knees. What does that coach have to say? Number two, to collect in numbers. Crowd? To collect in numbers. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Moving on to uh, transitive time. 1A, to fill by pressing or thronging together, as in a room crowded with children. Might not be my favorite place to be. I think the noise would get to me pretty quickly. But it's probably kindergarten or something. So they're learning and they're socializing. And that's very good for their brains. 1B, to press, force, or thrust into a small space. Mm. It's not something I would like to do. Two things in a row. I don't want to be around. Uh, what do, 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 press by filling a throwing, uh, small space. Okay, we did that one. Number two, synonyms are push and force. And this is often used with the word off or out, as in crowd a person off the sidewalk. Crowd a person off the sidewalk. Well, I don't like it when people do this. Is, is this literally three or four people walking down the sidewalk and they don't give enough room for the one person who's coming towards them? This this is, this is a thing. I have a thing with this for sure. 
I don't like it when people don't. This is this you know this is the time of the show when Spencer tells you how he feels about something. He he actually has opinions sometimes. Uh, I always get out of the way when there's someone coming towards me. Unless there's plenty of room, then you're fine. But you know, two people, three people, even just if one, it's worse when it's just one person and they don't get out of the way. Two people, three people. I know there's a lot of you. I think one of you can scoot over, please. You don't need to be hogging the sidewalk. I'm going to be respectful. You can be respectful equally right back at me. I think that would be fine. Okie dokie. Number 3A, to urge on. Like a big crowd of people urging on that bowler who's on the last ball and he's about to get a 300 game. That would happen. There would be a crowd in a bowling alley if that happened. That's crowd. Number 3B, to put on in excess of the usual for greater speed. And the thing that you are putting on is a sail. So I guess, you know, the sail is very good at catching the wind. So uh, so in excess of the usual for greater speed. It's worded very oddly, but my thought is if you want more speed, you put up the sail, you're going to go faster. You're going to get the wind pushing you. Aren't you supposed to have the sail up anyway? If you want to coast, nah. If you want to just relax, you're going to take the sail down. But if you want to go, 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 yeah, get that sail up there. And I guess you call it crowd. That's why it's here. Four, to put pressure on, as in don't crowd me, I'll pay. You got to give me some space so I can get out my wallet. Number five, the synonyms are throng and jostle. Throng and jostle and crowd. Throud, jostle, and crowd went into a bar. Number six, to press or stand close to, as in the batter was crowding the plate. Why do they do that? Do they think that uh, the person is going to throw it outside and that's why they're closer to the plate so they can get it better? Maybe. I don't watch so much baseball. Is there any etymology uh, from Middle High German kroten, which means to crowd, from Old English crod, although I have no idea how they say that, crod, and that means multitude. Also... Well, this doesn't make any sense to me, but also from Middle Irish, gruth, and that means curds. What what sort of curds are we talking about? Cheese curds? Whey curds? What curds? And how is that a crowd? Is it, Maybe it's a crowd of curds. Everything has a name. Uh, what is it? Um, there, a group of ravens or crows is called a murder and there's a school of fish what is what is a a bunch of crowds you could call that curds curds of crowds that was terrible second form of crowd this is the noun from 1565 one a large number of persons especially when collected together and the synonym is Throng. Throng, 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 throng. That's very difficult to do. 2A. The great body of the people. The synonym is populous. What do the crowds think? I don't care. 2B. Most of one's peers, as in, follow the crowd. If the crowd went and jumped off the bridge, would you do it? Yeah, because they were my friends. Three, a large number of things close together, as in, I saw a crowd of golden daffodils. And that is from William Wordsworth. (laughs) Wait, that's a real name? (laughs) Thought that was a made-up name. Uh, There is ellipses in the quote. So it's, I saw a dot, dot, dot. Oh, no, I saw a crowd, dot, 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 of golden daffodils. What was in the middle of the sentence? We will never know unless 
we take five seconds of research on Google and then maybe we'll find it. Four, a group of people having something as a habit, interest, or occupation in common. I should have finished the sentence, but I didn't see it. A group of people having something in common. That is called a crowd. And the things that they uh, that they have could be a habit or an interest or an occupation. That Those are your people. Habits, interests, occupations. Yeah, those are your people. You might have a bunch of different groups. We've talked about that before a little bit. I know I do have those. As in, in with the wrong crowd. Also as in, the Hollywood crowd. Some might argue that those are exactly the same, but not entirely. We have synonym information, crowd, throng, horde, crush, and mob mean an assembled multitude. That's another good word, multitude. Crowd implies a close gathering and pressing together, as in a crowd gathered. Throng and horde suggest movement and pushing, as in a throng of reporters, also as in a horde of shoppers. There's movement and pushing. Uh, Yes, both of those examples make sense. Good job. Dictionary. Crush emphasizes the con the compactness of the group crush emphasizes the compactness of the group the difficulty of individual movement and the attendant discomfort as in a crush of fans there is a lot going on with that word it's very compact it's difficult to move um where's the other one uh and it's not comfortable I'm yes, sitting in a football stadium would definitely be a crush of fans. It's just you can't move. It's uncomfortable. A lot of people, although, you know, there's at least a little space, you can get more compact. Mob implies a disorderly crowd with the potential for violence, as in an angry mob. This was I love these synonym information sections because it's just a a very good description of various types of crowds because they are specifically very different and somebody actually took the time to think about how to describe those. (laughs) Bailey, that's where you come in. This is our last word. It is the third form of crowd. Don't worry, it's much shorter. Noun from the 14th century. One, an ancient Celtic stringed instrument that is plucked or bowed. Called also, hmm, what? Cruth? C-R-W-T-H. Maybe it's pronounced crowd, but I'm not so sure. And number two, English dialect. The synonym is violin. So somewhere, somewhere specific, they call a violin a crowd, probably because the crowd, would the crowd have been older? And then the violin came later, and they were like, ah, that's so similar to a crowd. We're just going to call a violin a crowd, even though it's not the same, because there is a picture of this uh, instrument, and it is uh, very boxy looking. It's sort of like, Sort of like a violin, but it's unfinished. They haven't cut it out of its shape. Uh, They haven't cut the shape out of the, you know, the full size. But, uh, you know, it looks interesting. It looks like they used the top of it, the back of a chair for part of it. And then just a a skinny box for the rest of it. Um, Who knows if I'll be able to find an audio example. But if I can, I will put one in somewhere. And uh, and then maybe I'll post a picture on the social media and you can look at it too because you can't find it on your own. Uh, okay, so in this episode we had croupier, 
Cruz, Crustad, Crouton, Crow, 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 Crowbar, Crowd, Crowd, Crowd. Well, I'm gonna be I'm gonna feel very sad by picking a word of the episode because all all of them were so good. They all had potential, but there can be only one winner today. Uh, so I feel bad for all of you. Eh, you know, which one? Maybe maybe Crouton, uh, because, you know, it's croutons. Um, this puff pastry thing sounds pretty interesting, too, but we're, we're, we're putting way too much thought into this. Let us pick crouton as the word of the episode. All hail crouton. You are the winner. And I am sorry, if, if anybody was here for, you know, just the reading of the dictionary in short segments, that's kind of what this used to be, and it has evolved a bit more to have me talk more, I guess. Uh, so, the, you know, the episodes are getting longer. We're, we're, oh, yeah. Anyway, if you like it, great. If you don't, I'm sorry. Just listen to the A's over and over again. Okay, thank you for listening to this, and until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds, it's the dictionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is up, people? How are you doing? Uh, I think yesterday I mentioned that I was drinking one of those far too ridiculous sodas. Well, I, uh, I got another one. I don't have it next to me at the moment. I was drinking it earlier. It's in the other room. Don't worry about it. This one is horchata flavored and it should be good because horchata is already sweet and very tasty i love it oh so much i don't drink enough of it but i don't know i mean you know it tastes like you'd think it would taste just sugary and sweet and chemically and uh but 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 the horchata one it tastes kind of nutty and i don't think horchata is made from nuts i think it's like a rice milk uh, so I don't know why they made it nutty. You, g- you guys got to go back to the drawing board. Hey, let's talk about some words. Okay, so the first word is crowdedness. Crowdedness. Uh, yeah, crowd, then the past tense ed, and then ness. Noun from 1823. The quality or state of being crowded. My brain has crowdedness. Boo-doo-boo-boo-boo-boo. Next is crowdfunding. One word, noun from 2006. What was the first, what was the first thing that was doing crowdfunding? What was invented in 2006? I don't know if it would have been GoFundMe mm, or Kickstarter. I feel like all of those, I feel like they came later. Maybe I'll have to do a little research and put it in the show notes. Um, okay, crowdfunding is the practice of su- the practice of su- <laughs> why is it not coming out? Okay, it is the practice. Oh, see, that's a sign that I have to slow down. The practice of soliciting financial contributions from a large number of people, especially from the online community. The practice of taking people's money for a thing. I guess I'm doing that with Patreon. If you want to go join that, you can give me money. I'm taking money from the crowd. Um, A lot of great things have been created by crowdfunding. Um, Oscar-nominated and possibly Oscar-winning movies have been made because of things like Kickstarter. Uh, That stop-motion movie... Anomalisa. I don't think I said it right. Anomalisa. Uh, that, I think, was nominated for an Oscar. I'll have to check my sources on that. Again, check the show notes for more info when I don't know something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty great thing. I think it gets a little overused, probably. I don't know. Maybe there's some funny things on GoFundMe where people are asking for money for something that they shouldn't be asking money for. Maybe I'll find a good one. Um, and, uh, but yeah, overall, I think it's pretty good. It, it's, what it's doing is it's taking the power out of corporations, essentially. Um, and it's spreading the wealth amongst the people. 
If the people want a thing made or created, they're going to say, yeah, I will give you money to do that. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there's a bunch of problems with it, but overall, I think it's a pretty good thing. Oh, I have no idea what my sound effect was. dee 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 doo 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 It's not even a sound effect. Next is Crowdy. Crowdy, with an I-E. Noun from 1820. A Scottish cottage cheese that is partially cooked. And uh, this is from crud or crude, which means curd. So curd to, I'm just going to pronounce it crud, because that's what it looks like. Uh, And then crowdy. Uh, why, what, are, what are the Scots doing over there with their cottage cheeses? You're going to partially cook it? What happens to the Scottish the, the Scottish cheese? That's kind of what it is, the Scottish cheese. Uh, okay, that sounds interesting. It's called Crowdy. Next is Crowd Pleaser. Two words with a hyphen. Noun from 1943. One as a performer or product that is notably or reliably popular or appealing. One that is reliably popular. I like that word reliably in this case. They're always going to make something popular. As in, a flamboyant crowd pleaser given to mad feats of daring. And that is a quote from Tony Hendra, H-E-N-D-R-A. A flamboyant crowd pleaser. So this person is a crowd pleaser because they are notably or reliably popular or appealing. They are flamboyant. And they also do mad feats of daring. Kind of tempted to see if we can figure out when this was from, where it was written, and who they were talking about. uh, Crowd pleasing, also with a hyphen, that is an adjective. Next is crowd sourcing. One word, noun from 2006. The practice of obtaining needed services, ideas, or content by soliciting contributions from a large group of people and especially from the online community rather than from traditional employees or suppliers. I feel like eventually every word in here in this book is going to be related to online somehow. Hmm, you're getting things crowdsourced. It's like crowdfunding where you're taking money from people, but crowdsourcing is more generic than that. It is, you're sourcing just anything. Services, ideas, or content could be lots of things. That's crowdsourcing. I think if it's like a, a publication of some kind, BuzzFeed, you know, ton. there's tons and tons of those types of online things. They probably crowdsource their content because I would suspect they don't have to pay the people as much. The people, somebody just writes a thing and they're like, hey, I'll buy that from you for a bit of money. How much do they make? I don't know. Uh, but then they, you know, they're not paying somebody to be on staff. They just pay them per thing that they make. I think that I think that's probably a good way to be. Although people do need jobs because we need money for some reason. Dee 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 ba dee boo. Next is crow foot. F- crow foot. One word. Noun from the 14th century. Uh, I have a feeling I know where this is going, at least partially. So, the plural is normally crow feet. But the plural for number one is crow foots. Let's find out why, maybe. It is any of numerous plants having leaves with cleft lobes. Maybe the leaves kind of look like the feet of crows? Mm, But that might be a stretch. We'd obviously have to see it to decide for ourselves. Uh, And then especially the synonym buttercup. So buttercup is a type of crow foot, maybe? Number two is the number one definition for crow's foot. Uh, See, that's what I was thinking of, crow's foot, um, which 
You'd think it would be right here, right? No. It's because of that S after the word crow. It's not going to be until the end of tomorrow's episode. Crow's foot, number one definition, and that is usually used in plural, which would be crow feet. And I'm pretty sure those would be the wrinkles next to my eyes, which will just grow more and more pronounced as I do this podcast. Did it do ba do ba do? Next is the first form of the word crown. This is um, also our last word. We're going to do both forms here. Crown, noun. The crown is a noun from the 12th century. One, a reward of victory or mark of honor, especially the title representing the championship in a sport. Uh, which sports have a crown? I think think they're less than there used to be these days. There's a lot of trophies. I don't know sports well enough. I'm pretty sure there's it's the something crown. Is it is it golf? Is it there's something something like that? I cannot think of what it is. There's a crown championship. Number two, a royal or imperial headdress or cap of sovereignty, and the synonym is diadem. D I A D E M. Three, the highest part, as three A, the topmost part of the skull or head. The crown of your head is just the very top. But see, what is it? How big is this topmost part? Is it where does it end? What's the what's the circle around? Is it the as big as a quarter? Is it as big as a tortilla? Do we need to put those on our heads to figure out what? How what? How much of my crown is a tortilla? That's not what I was trying to ask. Um, we also have three B, the sub part to the highest part. Three B, the summit of a mountain. Three C, the head of a foliage of a tree or shrub. Three D, the part of a hat or other headgear covering the crown of the head. So the part of the hat or headgear that covers the crown of the head is called the crown. So does that mean the bottom part of a crown? No, that's not. The bottom part of a hat is the crown, and the top part of the head is the crown. So in the worlds of heads, in the world, in the head world, they think of crown as the bottom of a thing. 3E, the part of a tooth external to the gum or an artificial substitute for this. And then it says to see the tooth illustration. We're going to get to learn all about which tooth is called what, that what the name is. Maybe they'll have the, the letter and the number. I think that's a thing that dentists do. And then maybe we'll get to learn what each part of the tooth is called. Like this one, the part of a tooth external to the gum or, so is it the whole the whole top part, the whole white top part of a tooth? Is that just called the crown? It's basically like your tooth, except for the inside or the root. That's at least what I'm gathering here. Four, a wreath, band, or circular ornament for the head. And I skipped a line when I went to finish that, and I thought it said, a wreath, band, or circular ornament for the tooth illustration. 5A, something resembling a wreath or crown. It just needs to resemble it. If you put it on your head, looks kind of like a crown, we can call it a crown. 5B, the knurled cap on top of a watch stem. And knurled is spelled K-N-U-R-L-E-D. What is that word? Knurled? Um... Yeah, so I think this is just the part... Isn't this the part that sticks out on the out the side of a watch that you use to, to dial things in and set the time and turn it around? Isn't that the crown? I feel like I've heard that in relation, but I could be wrong. Um, but the, the description... If you don't know watch parts, the description is not helpful whatsoever because they don't have enough space to put in all the information. Like, what's the watch stem? 
Number six is often capitalized. 6A1, imperial or regal power. And a synonym is sovereignty. 6A2, the government under a constitutional monarchy. Because the monarchy, they like their crowns. They wear lots and lots of crowns, I think. And so they just call it the crown. 6B, the synonym is monarch. 7. Something that imparts splendor, honor, or finish. And the synonym is culmination. Something that imparts. So something that is providing splendor, honor, or finish. What what is the word what does the word finish mean in this context? I am not aware of a definition of finish that is similar to splendor or honor. 8A. Any of several old gold coins with a crown as part of the device. Part of the device, you're using words that we normal English speakers do not understand in these contexts. Who, the side, is the the flat part of a coin, is that called the device? Nobody says that. 8B. An old, usually silver British coin worth five shillings. I don't think we've ever had crown coin here in America because we didn't become a country officially and make our own money until we were away from the crown. Uh, But the people were probably using crown money here, you know, before the Revolutionary War. 9A, this synonym is... Corona with a K, spelled K-O-R-U-N-A, Corona. Whoa, we have four in a row that are similar. 9B, the synonym is Corona with a K. 9C, synonym is Crone with a K. And 9D, the synonym is Croon with a K. Corona, Crona, Crone, Croon. I think those all basically mean crown. I think those are um, money, the names of different money used in either a country or multiple countries, probably similar, I don't know, could they be, they could either be the same, they they could either be money in four different countries that are very similar, or they could be the names of individual denominations of money in one country. That's, those are my suspicions. We'll have to find out. 10A, the region of a seed plant at which stem and root merge. Uh, That's probably because when a seed starts to push up from the ground, this is just a guess, it probably pushes up the dirt, so it creates a little little bump, which would be, you know, maybe it looks like the top of the head. I don't know. I'm just guessing the crown. Uh, It could also be, if we're relating this stem and root thing to human and hat, maybe the, uh, the if the human is the root or the root, then the crown is the top, and then the stem is the hat, and the crown is the bottom. Where they meet is the crown. I am always going to look at plants now as roots is the human, and the, the whole plant on top is just a big fancy hat. 10B. The arching end of the shank of an anchor where the arms join it. And then it says to see the anchor illustration. We, we already went through that. If you, if you didn't listen, you why haven't you started from the beginning? Crowned, adjective. Crownless, adjective. Uh, okay, this is from the Latin corona, which means wreath or crown. From the Greek coroni, which is culmination, or something curved like a crow's beak. That is also, coroni means something curved like a crow's beak, or literally just the word crow. Crow, there's more crow. There's from Greek corax, which is raven. So, somehow it went from raven and crow to crown and wreath. This is kind of an interesting pathway. Not sure if it's just because they were similar words. 
and something weird happened? I don't know. Now we must have a crow wearing a crown. Dee dee doo ba doo ba dee boo boo. Second form of crown, verb from the 12th century, starting with transitive 1a, to place a crown or wreath on the head of, specifically to invest with regal dignity and power. 1b, to recognize officially as, no, that's it, okay, to recognize officially as, as in, they crowned her athlete of the year. I don't think they were literally putting on crowns, although it's possible they might, they might. But yes, you can just, uh, if you're officially recognizing somebody or something as a thing, then you can crown them that. 1C, to award a championship to, as in, crown a new champion. Number two, to bestow something on as a mark of honor or recompense, and the synonym is adorn. Now, I'm just making sure that I didn't skip anything. Yes, okay. Number three, the synonym is surmount. Another one is top. Surmount and top, crown. Especially to top with a checker to make a king. And the example of the thing that you were doing this would be just a checker. You top a checker with a checker to make a king. That's when one checker goes to the other side of the checkerboard and then you put a checker on the checker, and then it is king checker. Crown me, they say, right? Number four, to bring to a successful conclusion. Synonym is climax, as in the role that crowned her career. Successful conclusion. I guess her career was over after that, but at least it was successful. Five, to provide with something like a crown, as 5A, to fill so that the surface forms a crown. Uh, well, yeah, liquid, when it's in a thing, it gets displaced a little bit. And so I think depending on the thing, it might either curve up or curve down, concave, convex. Uh, I don't know what the rules are about that. 5B. To put an artificial crown on, what? On a tooth. People say that I got a crown put on, right? How bad does your tooth have to be to put a crown on it? Luckily, I have never had anything worse than a cavity. I'm very disappointed that I ended up getting cavities, but that, I think, was just my own fault. Number six, to hit on the head. I shall crown you the king of beatings. I do not know what that meant. So, next, we have the intransitive verbs. Number one is talking about a forest fire. To burn rapidly through the tops of trees. Of course, it's crown because those are the crowns of the trees, the tops. Number two is uh, talking about childbirth. And it says, to appear and begin to emerge headfirst or crown first at the vaginal opening, as in the baby's head crowned. They call that because they're seeing their crown. It's the first thing that is visible of any human being is the crown. Unless, you know, unless they're breached, flipped around, that sometimes happens, which is not great. Uh, But by and large, that is the very first thing that anybody sees of us I wonder if there's any, I wonder if they've done a test on personality-wise, are people different who were born breached or cesarean? There must be some sort of studies about that. Maybe I'll do a little research. This one's going to have a lot of notes. Okay, so the words in this episode were crowdedness, crowdfunding, crowdy, crowd pleaser, crowdsourcing, crowfoot, crown and crown. I think I'm going to pick crowdsourcing as the word of the episode because 
it's uh, it's it's great to have the crowd, all the people help. Uh, you know, that's how we should be like. We should all be coming together to do things. I think I think that's good. Crowdsourcing is a really great thing, and everybody should come together to make stuff. Boop boop. All right, I'm gonna end the episode there. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. That's the podcast. It's my podcast where I uh, say some stuff. Um, I am currently live streaming this on Instagram. I have no idea if anybody will watch this. I'm only going to do it for a couple of minutes, maybe. Uh, But hey, it's just another fun way to do this. Um, so let's, uh, let's tell, let's say the things that I say, uh, you can go to your preferred podcast platform and subscribe and of course share it all over the place and, uh, go write a review and rate it. Give the, you might as well just do the five stars. I think that's just what you should do. And you can follow this social media stuff on at diction at, uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, at DictionaryPod. Email is DictionaryPod at gmail.com. There is a Patreon in the show notes, and you can go do that thing if you want to. Get episodes pretty early. Uh, The one that I'm recording today, right now, won't air until May 15th, which is a very long time from now. What are some other things? There's a Google Voice number in the show notes. Uh, You can call it and leave a message. And I think that's pretty good. Okay. So we're just going to read the first word, and I think we'll end this, uh, and nobody will have joined, which is sounds about right. Okay. The first word is crown colony. C-R-O-W-N. Second word, C-O-L-O-N-Y. Noun from 1828, and it is often capitalized. Uh, both of the C's are capitalized often. This is a British colony over which the crown retains some control. That's that's what we used to be. Um, and then maybe there are still places like that around the world. I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't follow that stuff a lot. Okay, I'm going to end this live thing. Uh, and then you'll just have to uh, download, stream this episode on May 15th when it arrives, and then you can go listen to all the other episodes too. Okay, Instagram, bye. Okay. I'm going to just let that, I'm not going to, I can't tag, I'll share it later. All right, we need a sound effect. Boom, 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 boom. Next is crowd court, two words, noun from 1827. A court in England and Wales that exercises jurisdiction over matters formerly heard by the quarter sessions and criminal matters formerly heard by the courts of assize. Assize. I don't understand any little bit of what this is because it is British. Jurisdiction over matters formerly heard by the quarter sessions and criminal matters. Okay, so the the uh, ju- matters that used to be heard by the quarter sessions, also criminal matters, which used to be hear- heard by the courts of assize, which is A S S I Z E. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, it's the courts in England and Wales. Boom, 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 ba, boom, boom. Next is crooner. I think you can say crooner or crowner. Yes, because it is, it's the word crown and then E-R. Crowner or crooner. Noun from the 14th century. It is chiefly dialect in England. I'm, I'm, th- I'm assuming that's England. Um, and then the synonym is coroner. So would this be the one, the coroner who like deals with dead people? They call them the crowner or the crooner? Dump, 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 da, dump, ba, boom. Next is crown it. Crown, crown with an E-T, crown it. Noun from the 15th century. 
It is archaic, and the synonym is coronet. I guess they used to call it the crownet. Maybe it was the the horn of the queen. Boom, 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 boom. Next is crown gale. Gale is G-A-I-L. Two words, and I th- you see, I get so confused. Maybe it's gall. I think it might be gall. I honestly can't tell. We're just going to say gall. Crown gall. Noun from the 1900. A disease that affects many species of plants and is caused by a bacterium which forms tumorous enlargements usually just below the ground on the stem. And the bacterium scientific species name is Agrobacterium tumefaciens. I'm not sure if that's the correct way to say it. Um, so, a uh, disease that affects many plants which forms tumorous enlargements just below the ground. So, this is where the stem and the root join, which we learned in yesterday's episode is called the crown. Uh, that is where these uh, tumors, these tumorous enlargements, this is where they grow. Doom, 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 doom. Next is crown glass. Two words, noun from 1706. One, a glass blown and whirled into the form of a disc with a center lump left by the worker's rod. With a center lump left by the worker's rod. Uh, We need to find a picture of this. I'm sure I've seen it, but I can't really visualize it right now. It's blown and then it's whirled, a form of a disc. Okay, I believe you. I just have to see it for myself. Number two, alkali lime silicate optical glass having relatively low refractive index and low dispersion value. Glass, it must be sort of shaped like a crown or curved like the like the, the crown on your head. Maybe that's why it's called crown glass. Doom, 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 doom. Next is crown jewel. Two words, jewel like the singer. Noun from 1649, one is plural. The jewels belonging to a sovereign regalia, or it might be a regalia. Uh, examples of these crowns would be just the crown and the scepter. Sorry, examples of the jewels. Jewels would be on the crown and the scepter. And then the sovereign, the sovereign's regalia owns these crown jewels. I have seen the crown jewels in England. I went to the Tower of London, which is where they're kept. Whether they're the real ones or not, I don't know. But they have some mighty large jewels that maybe they don't, shouldn't totally have. There's, there's a whole drama about that, isn't there? Number two for crown jewel. The most attractive or valuable one of a collection or group. Ah, this episode here. This is my crown jewel. We won't know which which episode is the crown jewel until we finish the whole thing. We can't be making guesses. Think there's there's going to be some good ones up ahead. Do 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 do. Next is crown land. Two words. Crown land. Hey, everybody, let's go to crown land. Noun from 1613. One, land belonging to the crown and yielding revenues that the reigning sovereign is entitled to because they own you and your land. This is where their, their people on the horse come across and say, hey, the king or queen needs your money. Give it to us. But I don't have any money. Number two. Public land in some British dominions or colonies. Boom, ba doop, boop, boop, doom, boom. Next is crown molding. Two words, noun from 1946. Molding that crowns a surface or structure. Especially molding that runs between the top of an internal wall and a ceiling. And I am looking at some crown molding right now because. That's how fancy I live. I know I don't live fancy at all. But yes, it's a very old building, so there's there's crown molding. 
Why do they call it? Well, because why, why do they call it crown molding? Because it's at the crown of the wall, the top of it, and it, uh, I believe, the shape of it, whatever wavy thing is up there, has been molded in some way. Um, so yeah, some yeah. Some some things like the top of a banister. You got one of those things. I think those have been molded. Something that goes across the wall. I don't know if that's been molded necessarily, but maybe in some way it has. Next is crown of thorns. Three words from 1964. A starfish of the Pacific region that is covered with long spines and feeds on coral polyps, sometimes causing destruction of coral reefs. Called also crown of thorns, starfish. And in that case, crown of thorns has hyphens. Uh, the scientific name is acanthaster. <laughs> Ac- acanthaster. That's the only way I can think of how to say that. Acanthaster. It could be that, but I think acanthaster makes more sense maybe. And then plancy or plansi. Acanthaster plancy. Why does it not say that it's a noun? It's a starfish. Starfish are noun. So it's a noun. Uh, It's got long spines. Maybe we should post a picture of this crown of thorns. Starfish. Uh, I also thought maybe we should post a picture of some crown molding because it's a visual thing that you can look at. I'm sorry, um... To the blind people who who can't look at my wonderful social media, um, but I also uh, feel sorry for deaf people who can't hear my wonderful podcast. Maybe we're going to have to do a video version of this, and my sister will interpret because she's a sign language interpreter for the deaf. Do, 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 do. Next is Crown Prince. Oh, good. There is Princess. Two words. Noun from 1791. One, a male heir apparent to a crown or throne. Two, one prepared or favored to fill a prospective position. That's that they're the the prince with a crown, and eventually they will get the real crown. Do 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 do. Next is crown princess. Two words, noun from eighteen sixty three. Why, why are there always these disparities? Mm, let's see. It's about 70, just about 70 years. Number one, the wife of a crown prince. I guess that makes sense, but I sure hope that the daughter of a king or queen is in here. Yes. Number two, a female heir, a parent or heir presumptive to a crown or throne. Now, the, the crown prince one didn't say that. It just said a male heir apparent to a crown or throne. Uh, And then the princess one said a female heir apparent or heir presumptive to a crown or throne. So does that mean that if there is no prince, then it goes to the princess? I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Sometimes at least. Maybe that's what it means, heir presumptive. Doom, 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 doom. Oh, those are some bad, bad notes there. I I so apologize. I didn't know what I was doing. Next is crown roast. Two words, noun from circa 1909. A fancy roast. A fancy roast of lamb, veal, or pork made from the rib portions of two loins skewered together at the ends to form a circle. It's the most fancy roast I've ever heard of. Doom, 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 doom. Next is crown rust. Two words. Noun from circa 1899. A leaf rust of oats and other grasses that is caused by a fungus and is characterized by rounded light orange uridinia and buried tilia. Um, not sure what a leaf rust is. Uh, the fungus species name is Pucinia coronata. And of course, I don't know exactly how to pronounce that. It's got these rounded light orange somethings 
Uridinia, whatever that is, and it has buried Telia. Somebody buried the Telia. Um, yeah, I, I, that's about all I can give you. Doom, 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 doom. Next is crown vetch. Two words, vetch. This is just like it sounds. V e t c h. Noun from circa 1900, a Eurasian herb of the legume family that is naturalized in the eastern U.S. and has umbels of pink and white flowers and sharp angled pods. The scientific name is Corentia or Corentilla varia. A, a wonderful name for a Eurasian herb. Doom, 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 doom. Next is crow's foot. Here we go. Crow's has an apostrophe S, and then there is a hyphen before the word foot. Noun from the 14th century. One, a wrinkle extending from the outer corner of the eye. And this is usually used in plural. Crow's feet. It's the feet of the crows. It's like a crow stood on your face for a very long time. Maybe it's constantly standing there, and that's why the wrinkles get deeper and deeper and more pronounced. Uh, but, you know, they're nice because they show that you have been uh, smiling a lot. When you smile naturally, your eye muscles contract, and so you squint a little bit. Uh, if you fake smile, I mean, you you can fake smile by doing this action if you're aware of it, if you're conscious of it. But normally, if somebody is fake smiling, they're not doing the eye wink thing. So that's where you got to look. And that, you know, if you're squinting your eyes, you get more of the crow's feet over the ages, the ages and ages and ages, and you've smiled a lot. So I hope I have the the biggest, deepest crow's, crow's feet wrinkles ever. Number two for crow's foot is the number one definition for crow foot. Next is crow's nest. Two words, noun from 1818. A partly enclosed platform high on a ship's mast for use as a lookout. And then also a similar lookout as for traffic control. Uh, the the people on the Titanic in the crow's nest, uh, they did the best they could, but there were a lot of problems, so they 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 failed. They tried, but they failed. Um, traffic control. The first thing I thought of was the cars. Are there any intersections in the world that have somebody up in a high up basket looking down at traffic? Possibly. I wouldn't be surprised, but I've never heard of it. But more so, I think they're talking about air traffic control. They got that big, tall tower, and then they can see the planes and also look at their computers because they definitely need computers these days. That's Crow's Nest. Next is Crow Step. Crow Step, one word, noun from 1822, any of a series of steps at the top of a gable wall. Crow stepped is an adjective. So a gable wall. So I guess it just would this just just be like little uh, bricks making little stairs big enough for a crow to hop up maybe and that's maybe why they're called crow step. Do 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 do. do. Crozier is next. C R O Z I E R variation of crozer or crozier, however you want to say it, spelled with an S. beep be doo beep boo Next is CRP, all caps. So we are, we're done with the CROs. CRP, all caps, abbreviation for C-reactive protein. And, uh, oh, I was thinking of WKRP. That's not quite the same thing. This is CRP. Next is the first form of CRT, all caps, noun from 1941. And the synonym is cathode ray tube. But then also, 
a display device incorporating a cathode ray tube, CRT. The TVs that existed for a long time when I was a kid, uh, for a good chunk of my life, those were CRT TVs because they had a cathode ray tube in them. I never broke one open. There is a great video. I Maybe I will put the link in the show notes. Uh, the slow-mo guys on YouTube, they shoot stuff in slow-mo. Very cool stuff. And uh, they had one uh, one of their bonus episodes on their second channel that shows the, the lights being projected onto a CRT TV. Uh, and it's fascinating. So you should go look at that. Last word, CRT again, second form, abbreviation for carrier route or carrier route. That's probably a mail carrier. All right, the words today were crown colony, crown court, crowner, crown it, crown gall, I think, crown glass, crown jewel, crown land, crown molding, crown of thorns, crown prince, crown princess, crown roast, Crown Rust, Crown Vetch, Crow's Foot, Crow's Nest, Crow Step, Crozier, CRP, CRT, CRT. I have never said the word crown so much in my life in such a short period of time. Um, oh boy, I have to pick one of these? Um, well, I'm leaning towards that one maybe, just checking just to see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, I think I will probably pick crow's foot as the word of the episode because you know i'll get them if i if i get old enough i'll get them and they're a sign of smiling and laughing which sounds pretty great to me so i'll take them uh maybe i'll maybe i'll post a picture of my crow's foots Hey, that is going to be the end of this episode. Oh, I have forgotten to say if you care about any bit of my personal life for whatever reason, um, we a couple of movies I watched, my wife and I watched recently. Uh, just yesterday we watched This is Spinal Tap. Hadn't seen that in years. Oh boy, if you haven't seen that movie, you got to go watch that movie. The, the, the cameos from young people and just the ridiculousness, it's so good. I uh, My wife laughed out loud so much in during that movie i have not heard her laugh out loud so much during a movie in a, a while uh what else we watched uh i watched the power of the dog just to prepare for the oscars um it, it's a thinker it's good it's not my favorite but yeah it's 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 good um and then we watched i think it's pronounced synecdoche new york not the name of the town Schenectady, which I'm not even sure if I'm saying that correctly. But this movie is called Synecdoche, spelled differently. Uh, this movie, my short little thing to say is uh, I saw it years ago when it came out and I liked it, but was confused and it's just kind of an odd movie. Felt a little weird. Um, but then I, when I rewatched it, uh, I was very curious. I had been wanting to watch it again and uh, I very much relate to that movie. Uh, so it hit me in a different way at a different time in my life, probably about 20 years apart, actually. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's different. It's different, but it's worth a watch for sure. You're gonna, you might feel weird. Uh, I think that's all I got to say. Thank you to you for you listening to this to me. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.